it'll be a great pleasure to have our opening session, particularly a uh, great pleasure. It'll be moderated by Sir James Wolfinson, our co-chair, as you know, who needs no introduction whatsoever, and um, our very, very special guest who will open the session, and uh, who also needs no introduction. But I'm sure that Jim, as I see him coming in here, will not give up the pleasure of introducing her. And with that, let us welcome both Jim and Madame Lagarde. I was being I was being silly. Please sit down. Shall I sit here or there? Wherever you like. Please sit there. Okay. We have a very short time, simply by saying that uh, she may be one of the most remarkable women I've met, and uh, she's truly a leader that we need in the world today, and we're very lucky to have her. I give you Christine Lagarde. Well, thank you very much, uh, Jim, and, and thank you very much for having me and making such a pointed, perfect, short introduction of me. That's delightful. Um, I would like to thank uh, Richard Debs and obviously you, and I would like also to recognize Bill Frenzel and uh, Jim Kolb for having me and uh, making a little bit of time for the short, very short and brief remarks that I would like to make. And I'm going to just forget about my notes because I don't think that they're going to help me much. What we are currently uh, dealing with at the moment is what we have characterized at the IMF as the great transitions following what has been the Great Recession. Now, it's a little bit of a marketing term that we have used to fix people's mind on what is happening and what needs to be done. We are certainly seeing a big transition at play at the moment in the financial sector. That's the first one that is clearly uh, obvious. We're seeing transformation of the financial actors. We are seeing a restructuring of some of the banks in the way in which they deal with business. We are seeing shrinking activities in some sectors. We are seeing a different footprint from what they had a few years back. And that is happening uh, at the moment. Is that complete? Is that done? We don't think so. We believe that in the financial sector, there is much more work to be done. And there are particular areas where there should be more focus. We believe in particular that the shadow banking activity, that is not bad per se, but that is growing significantly in this country, but in a country like China as well, and to a lesser extent in Europe, should be really monitors, monitored, kept under, under check, and to the extent that it exposes the financial stability of those regions, it should be properly supervised. There's another area where we think that more work needs to be done as well, and that has to do with the derivative markets, where there are agreements underway between the United States and the European Union, but where clearly more transparency, uh, more known about what is happening on uh, CCPs would be perfectly welcome. And as a transition to what also we see happening in the uh, economic pattern in transitions, and focusing on the financial sector while we're still on it, we believe that in the euro area, there is still more work to do to dissipate any uncertainty that markets have about the health of Euro area banks. Now, I've had lots of pushback, uh, as I did actually two years ago when I made my Jackson Hole speech and called for recapitalization of, of the European banks, which eventually did happen later on down the road. What we are saying is not that we have secret information that would indicate that the banks are not in good health, but we're saying that there is enough market uncertainty and enough perception about not a perfect, healthy situation in all European banks that it requires urgent attention to be paid to the asset quality review that is planned and to the stress testing of European banks so that everybody that is interested actually understands how 
are the European banks doing? And if so, how the eventual weaker ones will be strengthened, recapitalized or restructured? Turning now to what we see as transitions in the economic patterns, there has clearly been a shift in the last three months. Remember, some three, four months ago, we were all seeing the emerging market economies driving the show, leading growth, and having contributed 80% of total growth in the last five years, continuing to do so. We were seeing advanced economy eventually beginning to produce some positive results, certainly in this country. Well, the situation has changed as a result in particular of the hinted tapering of the monetary policy of the Fed. And that hint of potential tapering under certain circumstances on the basis of certain criteria has exposed the vulnerabilities of those emerging market economies that had been the recipients of massive capital outflow. Now, not all of them. Some of them endured that phenomenon much better than others. If you look at Korea, for instance, Korea has done a lot better than others. But there are quite a few emerging market economies that have suffered as a result. And it's not only caused by the hint of the tapering. It has also exposed some inherent weaknesses of those economies that need to be addressed, that are now in the light, and that uh, must be taken care of by a set of policies that combine all the tools available, whether it's monetary policy, whether it's fiscal policy, whether it's structural reforms that are needed. So those are the kind of transitions that we're seeing, and that has led us to reassess, uh, in many ways, the uh, economic outlook and the forecast, in particular, that we have uh, for the global economy. We've revised downwards a little bit, put the global economy outlook at 2.9 for this year, 3.6 for next year, uh, and we have certainly lowered the expectations for the emerging market economies while we have strengthened eventually uh, that for the euro area, Japan to a certain extent, and not the US because there is too much uncertainty going on in this particular market. So moving on from that sort of description of the transitions that we see at play, and you could argue that there is a third transition that is also happening at the moment, which is the role played by the central banks and central bankers, uh, men and women alike, uh, in how they have accommodated space and time for policymakers to take the right set of decisions and how they've ventured into very uncharted territories, um, experimenting uh, accommodative monetary policies from Japan, from the US, from the ECB, from uh, the Bank of England, and so on and so forth. And that's a transition that is happening and from which clearly the central banks are going to have to unwind uh, in order to re-establish their sort of normal role, if there was such a thing uh, as a normal role. What is, I will, I will finish with the, the set of recommendations uh, that we make for these various uh, regional areas that I've mentioned. For the United States, we are saying very clearly that the first priority, and I'm not focusing on today and not next week, um, I'm sure we all do, but I'm not addressing that particular issue now, but the first priority that has medium-term consequences and global consequences as well uh, is the smooth uh, tapering of the unconventional monetary policy that has been adopted by the Fed. And uh, we attach to that the criteria of good communication, uh, gradual uh, phasing out, uh, and, and certainly a degree of cooperation between the players that takes into account the potential spillover effects of uh, that change of tack. We're also saying to the US, uh, put the fiscal house in order and don't uh, rush, hasten slowly, um, as Plato would have said, uh, not too much now, but make sure that you anchor properly uh, in the medium term so that there is more certainty about how you're going to deal with public finances and debt. Um, we are obviously saying that the current situation needs to be addressed as a matter of urgency because every work that we've done in the last few days indicates that the longer the uncertainty, the more damaging it is for the US economy as well as for the global economy. And we can look back at what happened in 2011, fixing the problem shortly 
uh, is not necessarily going to erase potential consequences that will outlast the day of the resolution of this matter. And it's not taking a political view. The IMF, like uh, the World Bank in, in any days, as, as Jim knows well, does not take a political view. But we're looking at the numbers, we're looking at the financial market, we're looking at the economy and at the needed stability in the context of this um, uh, subdued but yet recovery that we see. Euro area, we're telling them what I've just mentioned, make sure that there is no uncertainty and uh, reassure, if it's appropriate, after uh, due asset quality review and stress testing about the situation of your banks. Proceed with European Banking Union and for some of the countries uh, in that zone, continue, complete and implement the structural reforms that will um, help with the competitiveness of those countries. The same comment about structural reform applies to Japan, where we certainly are very interested uh, to see the uh, triple arrow um, deployed by, by the new authorities in Japan and where it's in our view necessary to move on with the third one uh, and, and, uh, and do so diligently so that the three are actually detailed, uh, accessible, measurable, which is not necessarily the case with the third one, despite the fact that it has been, in fact, announced. Looking at the emerging market economies, we're saying that they have to do everything they can to smoothen uh, the turbulences that will arise as a result of tapering. No matter how well communicated, no matter how gradual, no matter how the uh, tapering is, is discussed amongst uh, key players, our assessment is that there will be market turbulences. And uh, emerging market economies, depending on where they are, depending on the inflation they have, depending on the financial pressures they're under, uh, have to use all the tools available uh, from certainly using the flexible exchange rate as the first line of defense that should absorb most of the shock in our views, but also going into you know, further measures uh, if necessary. As far as the low-income countries are concerned, uh, we are seeing them as, as becoming, and that's another transition as well at play, we're seeing them becoming the, 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 the frontier economies of tomorrow, where you know, by securing probably the highest growth levels, whether you look at uh, emerge, some of the emerging Asian economies, uh, not low-income countries, or sub-Saharan African economies that need a lot of uh, help need a lot of support to continue the process of lifting uh, a lot of people out of poverty. We are seeing uh, better anchored policies. We are seeing buffers that need to be secured and preserved in order to face those turbulences. So that's what I wanted to say. And the key message that I saved for the end, uh, Jim, is that you are the Bretton Woods Committee. We both represent or have represented uh, and love Bretton Woods institutions. Well, I need your help because the IMF has gone through governance reform and there was a 2010 governance reform that was to be delivered upon before 2012, the end of 2012. And that has not yet taken place. And it has not yet taken place because one of the thresholds that needs to be reached and exceeded is 85% majority. And to get that 85% majority that facilitates better governance where emerging market economies are better represented than they are today, where low-income countries' shares are protected. We need all members to ratify the reform. And a key member which has a veto power over this transformation is the United States of America. So I would hope, as you have done in the past, because you have written to Congress, uh, I would hope that you would support this initiative yet again uh, to make sure that there is actual representativeness in the institution and credibility uh, in its action. Thank you very much. Well, that was the world in 15 minutes. Uh, I'd like to come back to just one question, Madame Lagarde, which is what's happening in the United States at the moment. You, of course, represent an uh, international, multinational institution. But we in this country are going through uh, something of a, a difficult period at the moment. And during the course of either today or coming days, uh, it's possible that there'll be a resolution. Uh, we talk about the international institutions having a big impact, but there is still a huge impact by what one country does 
and then the reaction of other countries is not always within an international context. It's to protect themselves individually. Could you give us a comment on what you see about the current situation and what are the impacts perhaps individually and how you would see some systemic response to what is happening here? Well, th this is, uh, Jim, very much work in progress because um, what we're trying to assess is the negative consequences that the no resolution of these two matters would have on the U.S. economy. Uh, from a fiscal point of view, from an economic point of view, how it would, af it would affect um, growth in this country. And what I can say at this point is that the shorter the duration, uh, the, the more limited the effect. But the longer it lasts, the more damaging it is, and it's not going to be linear. The second thing is we are also trying to assess the consequences on other countries outside the United States. And in our view, there will be consequences that will be driven by two channels of communication and transmission. One is trade, because if the US authorities have to balance budget from day two onwards, there will clearly be reduced public spendings, reduced activity, and therefore the trade uh, transmission channel will, will operate outside the United States. The second channel of transmission will be financial, because creating that degree of disruption in the treasury bond market and elsewhere as a consequence, given the size enjoyed by treasury bonds in various portfolios around the world, will create uh, very adverse consequences um, around the world. And is it the IMF that has the strength uh, to be able to bring some order to this situation? I think the leadership is in this city. Um, the economic recovery is happening everywhere else in this country. And uh, the consequences of failure to deliver would be, resent, would be felt in this country, but elsewhere in the world. We can help, we can measure, we can certainly, we are engaging with uh, other countries that fear the spillover effects, and we are helping them devise um, the set of policies that will be helpful for them. That's what we're doing at the moment. Given my past experience, do you think the developing countries are going to be those that are the worst hit? As, as always, as always, yeah. We have two minutes for one question, and I'd like the person who's most intelligent in the audience to ask. <laughs> yes, ma'am. <laughs> They're from the right country, I can see. Linda <laughs> Chao Yang, um, uh, Chair of the Asian Corporate Governance Association, a nonprofit based in Hong Kong, but for six years I was the United States Director of the Board of the Asian Development Bank. Uh, and I was right in the middle of the Asian financial crisis back in the late 90s. Uh, now, this country, we here have been, through the Federal Reserve, been pushing out trillion dollars every year for several years, from the one, two, three. And a uh, member of the emerging markets who have kind of followed the IMF uh, uh, <coughs> advice of opening up their markets have already suffered quite a bit, just to mention a taper. So I was wondering, of course, this tapering will have to end sometime. And what does IMF have in mind or would like to help those emerging markets to at least uh, mediate the harm on them when we in the United States cut off that flood of extra liquidity? Thank you. Well, thank you very much. The, the, one, maybe one word of caution. Um, I think we have often in the past given sort of broad brush um, recommendations that were addressed to the emerging market economies or the advanced, less so, but the emerging market economies sort of at large. What certainly has been demonstrated over the last few months is that each and every country has a specific set of circumstances of structural reforms at play, of bottlenecks uh, in place, of infrastructure needs, of a particular set of, of rates of adjustment in terms of currencies that need to be taken in isolation while using also the analysis of the spillovers and the interconnections. So I think it makes the analysis a bit more tailored, but probably also a bit more 
complicated and specific, but that's, that's the route that, that we have to take. Two things. One is what we observe is that in those countries that have flexible um, exchange rates, there has been the ability to absorb shocks. If you look at, say, the variation of, of the Indian rupee, for instance, it has depreciated significantly over the course of July and August, and it has regained uh, significantly as well uh, in the last few weeks as a result of a well-articulated uh, monetary policy and announcement made by the uh, Indian authorities. We're also saying that the entire toolbox has to be used, not just flexible exchange rates, not just you know, the, the openness uh, factor, but you know, macroprudential rules have to be used. Uh, and forex um, transactions, use of reserves, can be envisaged at a certain stage, not, not you know, right up front. And as you know, we have changed our views on uh, how to manage capital flows. Not that we have indicated that management of capital flows is absolutely fine, no problem, get on with it. But we certainly open the door once other tools have been used to the right degree to eventually taking a capital flow management uh, measures. Well, I made a promise to uh, I would get her out in 21 minutes. Well, since that first session was conducted with such commendable efficiency, which of course we're going to emulate, aren't we? Um, we are a few minutes early, but I think we'll go ahead and start because there is a lot to discuss on the whole question of not just what the global financial community is doing this weekend, but in particular on the question of emerging markets. And having just heard Madame Lagarde talking just now, if I had to summarize what she said with journalistic brevity, it would be brace yourselves <laughs> for the impending storm, not just outside, but in particular for what is going to happen when the taper finally gets underway. And brace yourself particularly for the emerging markets. Um, some of you may have taken part in some of the wonderful debates the IMF organized earlier this week on emerging markets. And what, emerged, what came out of those discussions was really quite alarming, both in terms of the degree to which the emer emerging markets have gone from being the stellar pupils in the class, which they were a couple of years ago, to slipping in terms of structural reforms, but also in terms of the big financial market risks going forward, particularly given the thinness of some markets and the liquidity problems that could emerge if investors start to exit. So with me to discuss this is Minister Tarman Shugam sorry, Shan Mugaratnam, who has kindly agreed to call me Minister Tarman, which is easy to pronounce, the um, Finance Minister of Singapore, and Governor Rajan from India, who I think is known to many of you here. And I'd like to start by asking Minister Tarman, first of all, when you hear the message of brace yourself, there's storms ahead, what exactly are you planning to do to try and protect Singapore from the potential of real market volatility going forward? Well, I think uh, maybe I'll address it a little more broadly because we haven't had too much turbulence in, in, in Singapore. We didn't, we didn't retain so much of the capital that was sloshing around because we are an intermediator. And likewise, we're not seeing a very substantial outflow. But I think basically, um, there's just far too much focus on the macro and not enough on the micro. Uh, every few years, the markets tend to try to focus on a new single variable, and the latest single variable is the current account deficit, once again. Uh, I think it's a little misleading. Uh, the picture is far more nuanced. There's some countries with good current account deficits, and there's some countries with bad current account deficits. You have to remember that the story of the Asian NIEs, Korea, Taiwan, Singapore, Hong Kong, was that for two decades, we ran very significant current account deficits. And that was part and parcel of the growth story. We were investing heavily, and despite high savings rates, we had a substantially higher investment rate than a savings rate. So current account deficits are not a bad thing. And I think we've got to focus a lot more on the micro. The outside of China, China is a special story. 
and, and increasingly should be looked at as a separate case by itself. If you look at emerging markets and you look at Asian emerging markets, the critical need is to raise investments, which taken it by itself worsens your current account deficits. But the critical need is to raise investments. We are, we are under-investing in emerging Asia, under-investing relative to the needs for productivity to improve and to catch up with the global leaders. And we are also investing very inefficiently where we are investing. That's true for China as well, right? So inefficient in investment and inadequate investment is really at the core of both the uh, structural challenge and the growth challenge. And I think there has to be a lot more focus on that. But in practical terms, the message that most emerging markets countries have taken away in the last couple of years is they need to self-insure and they cannot afford to run large current right. account deficits right. or they will be punished. So is there anything that the IMF or the Bretton yes. Woods community can do in practical terms to reassure them that they do not need to go out and self-insure to a massive degree? Yes, so I think um, the second best solution was building up of reserves. Um, the positive was reduction in fiscal deficits, which many emerging countries in Asia uh, actually went about. If you look at some of the countries that are under pressure in the current global market turbulence, some like Indonesia, actually have done a remarkable job in reducing fiscal deficits. Um, I think we have to address uh, an issue which we don't yet have answers for, and that is how do we deal with outsized capital flows in this new phase of financial globalization? outsized relative to what they were before because the financial cycle has, got, has increased in amplitude compared to the business cycle, and outsized relative to the absorption cap capacity in emerging markets. We have to address it. We have imperfect answers right now. We have some second best solutions like macroprudential policies, which Christine Lagarde was just talking about. But we, are, we, we shouldn't give up the idea of having a a first best solution that involves better international coordination and that involves some internalization of international spillovers in policy making uh, in the leading central banks. Okay, well I'll come back to the issue of creating a first best solution in a minute, but before we do I'd like to turn to Governor, Governor Rajan and say, you know, you are a country which has already experienced if not a full-blown storm, then a few squalls. And if Madame Lagarde is correct, you could be facing much, much worse in the next year or two ahead. Does that worry you? Well, first, I, I, I think, the, as uh, Tharman said, you have to focus on the details. And unfortunately, at times like this, uh, the financial markets don't focus on the details. Uh, in terms of, you know, are we worried? Uh, of course, everybody is worried about a global storm. But I think uh, to some extent, uh, uh, we, uh, in terms of our exposure, we, we have a lot of foreign institutional investment in equities, far less in debt. Uh, our exposure to foreign institutional investors in debt is about $35 billion, uh, which is a tiny fraction of the debt markets, and that's why our yields haven't moved as much with foreign institutional investors leaving. We've lost about $10 billion from those guys going. I think uh, that was probably 10 billion of the hottest money. Uh, maybe some more will go. But we have 280 billion in reserves. Uh, I don't worry about the rest of the money going. If they want to leave, they can leave. The real issue, however, is you know, I want to get India off the front page as far as certainly well, of your newspaper. You're helping to sell newspapers, so don't, stop, don't go I, too I far. I certainly want to get it off the front page of the Financial Times. I'm glad you come clutching the FT with I, you. So. I, I think one of, the, one of the problems is really that uh, in the good times, there are deficiencies in every economy which are overlooked in the press. You focus on, you know, for example, in India's case, on these wonderful engineers who seem to populate every nook and cranny of India. Uh, and you forget that infrastructure is relatively weak, that there are, uh, you know, issues in human capital, that we are, we have lots of regulation which we don't probably need. And in the bad times, you focus only on that and ignore the fact that there were other things that were responsible for the 10 years of 8% growth we had. So uh, there is a certain amount of mood swing which happens both domestically as well as internationally. We're as responsible for it as, as the international markets. And, and we get 
onto the front page where we certainly don't want to be, where we certainly don't deserve to be. Uh, I mean, just putting out some numbers which are worth thinking about. India's external debt to GDP is 22 percent, 22 percent, of which uh, about 5 percent is, is to the multilateral agencies. Uh, India's reserves to GDP is 15 percent of GDP. We can pay out, pay back all the short-term debt. Uh, if it wants to leave, we can pay it back. Now, a lot of it is trade credit, which gets rolled over every time. So in that sense, we don't have an external debt problem. Do we have an internal debt problem despite having large fiscal deficits? Fiscal deficit last year was 4.9 percent. It's large. We have a plan to bring it down, but is it that we're going to run into a financing problem for the government? Government debt to GDP is 66 percent, has come down every year for, for some time from 84 percent, and it's probably on its way down. Average government debt maturity is nine and a half years. It's all rupee denominated. Is there a risk of the government getting into trouble financing? No. Is there a risk of the country getting into trouble financing? No. So yes, we've had exchange rate depreciation. Perhaps it's overshot. Uh, it's come back a fair amount since the 68 it reached to 61 rupees to the dollar. But the point, however, is that we have to focus on the fundamentals. And clearly, for us, the major challenge is getting growth back. Uh, there are some very low-hanging fruit which we've got to pluck. We have made mistakes, no doubt. But is the India story over? Not a chance. There is a story still left. So the problem emerging markets have at times like this is getting the story, the truth about the fundamentals out. And this is where, I, I mean, I just came in, unfortunately I was elsewhere, but this is where organizations like the fund can help by separating the, the um, you know, by talking about the problems, but also about the strengths. And if you did a careful analysis of India, you would say, you know, there is really no financing issue in India. And yet, getting the story out in terms of fundamentals, if you look at the IMF report, does entail looking at the fact that there is a lot of structural reform that needs to happen in, in emerging markets in general. And if you look at what things like the Basel III capital requirements have done to banks in terms of their ability to hold inventory of emerging market assets, you're moving to a world where liquidity is going to become more and more of an issue in emerging market assets. How do you convince people if we do start to see more volatility and more of a storm in the emerging markets asset class in general, how do you convince people that Singapore and India should not be swept up in any bigger storm? Well, as Tarman said, Singapore has less of an issue recently than we have. But I would say we need to focus on getting our fundamentals even better than where they are, at least from our side. Uh, we are embarking on significant financial sector reforms over the next five years, deepening markets, increasing the variety of financial institutions in the markets, and reaching out to more and more underserved uh, you know, constituencies in India, whether they're people in the villages or whether they're small and medium enterprises. We have the strengths of having very strong technology. Uh, we can bring that to bear across the board. And of course, we have very many low-hanging fruit that we can pluck. I mean, one of the advantages of being a relatively poor country is we don't have to do miracles to get productivity growth. We can do just simple stuff, uh, you know, get rid of this regulation, get more entry there, and we can get growth. And what we're going to do in the financial sector is focus on that. If you look at the real sector, the government has been focused on trying to get its finances in order, but also on expanding the scope for investment. I'm particularly glad that I see reports in the paper. I can't confirm or deny it because I'm not aware of the discussions. But uh, Vodafone, the poster child for having problems in India, is actually thinking of upping its stake in India to become a 100% owned uh, subsidiary in India. That's the report I hear. But I think that's on par with the general sense that corporations that are willing to deal with the Indian system, right. in fact, make money in India. Now, should we be uh, proud of the difficulties we cause? No. We're working on making it simpler to get in. On the financial sector side, we changed, for example, most recently, the norms for foreign institutional investors to come into India, making it simpler for them to get in. But I think we have to work on this across the board. This is not necessary to solve our immediate problems, but this is necessary to create a better fundamental picture of India. And we'll work on it. Right. And there's one other question before I turn to Mr. Thalman. How much confidence do you have that if for any reason all of these wonderful reforms don't actually boost confidence, 
Um, and I can promise you we will put Vodafone probably on the front page because we love that kind of story. Um, but if these reforms don't boost confidence, do you think that the IMF can still act as an effective buffer if an emerging market like yourself run into serious problems? Because the history of something like, you know, since the history of Eurozone, if you look at how much money was required simply to help Greece, one lesson you can take away from that is what on earth is going to happen if these impending storms do actually create bigger squalls in countries like India? So, uh, one thing I can say with confidence, the chances of us approaching the IMF for money is zero over the next five years. Now, beyond that, I can't say anything. But over the next five years, it's zero. Uh, that said, uh, there are countries that have difficulty, and I think uh, what we should be talking about, and this is the point that Tharman was, was going towards, which I think is very important. We are seeing a cycle of pushing uh, easy financing across borders. Uh, first, it was towards the emerging markets in the 90s. They couldn't handle it. We had the emerging market crisis. They pushed back by building reserves. And it was the global savings glut that Ben Bernanke talked about, which created crises in industrial countries. Now the money again flew, flowed back to emerging markets with the ultra uh, unconventional monetary policies in the industrial countries, and the emerging markets are again facing difficulty. We have to ask ourselves, how do we solve this problem? Because whoever is trying to create demand, which spills over borders, is creating uh, unsustainable demand. And how do we fix the system such that we create sustainable demand? Does that mean slower growth? Does that mean that uh, central banks have to take into account the effects of their policy spillovers across countries? Or does it mean a new global architecture where there are reserve pools which are available uh, for countries that get into difficulty, but without the kind of stigma that currently uh, these, these, uh, any kind of international help has. So we have to debate it, and I think it's extremely important because we've gone through three cycles uh, of flows in the last, last two decades, and this is too much. It creates enormous problems. And do you have any faith whatsoever that it's going to be actually seriously on the agenda this weekend? I think we're going to start talking about it. I, I th certainly think, as you know, Tharman is, uh, has, has raised this issue, I think it's, it's an issue that is going to be extremely important in global discussions. Will we make a big difference in the short run? Maybe not, but we do need to start making, making some headway. I mean, what exactly would you like to see, Minister Tharman, if you were in charge of the meetings this weekend? I mean, do you have a favorite plan you'd like to unveil? And I ask that partly because early this week I was having lunch with some representatives from emerging markets countries who made the point that one fascinating new acronym that's come out in the last couple of years is a distinction between the UMP countries and the non-UMP countries, the countries that have unconventional monetary policy and the countries which don't. And so the question that was asked was, well, why can't the non-UMP countries have a bit of unconventional policies too? I mean, do you think it's time for emerging markets to get a bit more unconventional in what they do? Yes, and it'll, it'll all become more conventional. Uh, I think there's far too much focus on the U part of what is essentially a monetary policy aimed at keeping interest rates as low as possible uh, in the interests of a single economy. Uh, so far, U.S. Fed policy has been in the interest of the world, not just the U.S. economy, because it's trying to revive the economy. But over time, I think we're likely to see a U.S. economy that is more internationalized, uh, that will depend more on a part of the world that's growing much faster than the rest, which is the emerging world. And that, by its nature, means that even if you're focusing on domestic targets, inflation and stable economic activity, or not avoiding output gaps, even if you are focused in your traditional domestic targets, you will increasingly be concerned about the international feedback loops. So that's point one. Internalizing the international spillovers has to be part of the agenda. Point two, coordination. Coordination between leading central banks and also this whole somewhat amorphous group of emerging markets, but put together they're not amorphous, they're large, right? Desynchronized economic cycles means you can't all have the same monetary policy, but we do need to have a much better conversation 
and greater predictability of responses. Which brings me to the last point, which is macro prudential policy. This is now part of the toolkit. It used to be called unconventional, it's going to become conventional. Without macro prudential policies, emerging countries face too sharp a trade off between either ex extreme exchange rate volatility in response to outsized capital flows or very large swings in domestic liquidity that lead to bubbles, particularly in housing markets, but also other imbalances. And we don't need to have such a sharp trade-off. Something has to come in between, and that's macroprudential policy. Leverage ratios, margin requirements, tax policies, tax policies that vary across the cycle, for instance, for housing purchases. A whole range of somewhat unconventional policies will have to become part of the standard toolkit. The IMF can do a it has started this work, and speaking as the chairman of the IMFC, I think there's still a lot of work ahead in systematizing our understanding of what macroprudential policies work at different points in the cycle. It'll never be as perfect a game as inflation targeting, where you know you're looking at CPI inflation, you know what you're measuring it, what you're measuring, and you know the transmission mechanisms, or at least we think we know. Financial stability is less well defined, less well measured. We don't know the transmission mechanisms. They may change over time, but we've got to do it. Right. We've got to do it because the alternative is a far too unstable world. So the response to UMP as an unconventional monetary policy is UMPP, unconven unconventional macro prudential policy. Yeah, like. except that I, I, I think it's going to become conventional. We are, financial globalization is here to stay. The rise of the emerging world is here to stay and internalization of international spillovers, hitherto ignored, at least formally speaking, by the Fed and other leading central banks, will just become part of the game. And macroprudential policies, particularly in the emerging countries, but also in the advanced economies, will just be part of the standard toolkit. The U part will disappear. So CMPP, then. Um, I'm going to turn to the audience for questions in a minute, but before I do, I have one other question I'd like to ask you both, which you're probably going to hate, but I'm going to ask it anyway, which is, to what degree are you able to actually create contingency plans to cope with the possibility that notwithstanding Speaker Boehner's proposal today, we may see a very nasty shock in the Treasury's market later in October, the so-called Halloween fright. Are you able to con create contingency plans? And what are you actually doing in practical terms to prepare for that? Uh, to, to the debt? Uh, yes. The, the, OK. Um, Who would like to go first? <laughs> so, uh, <but laughs> Don't both volunteer. So uh, he hits the question more than I do. <laughs> so uh, let, let me say no one knows. And that's itself an important statement. Uncertainty and a lack of knowledge as to how markets are going to respond is itself a problem. Uh, unlike the situation when Ben Bernanke first announced tapering um, earlier this year, and yields started spiking up, and capital flowed back from the emerging world to, to the US especially. This time around, you're talking about yields rising because of nervousness about the US itself, and the possibility of well, some form of soft default, right? So it's not clear how capital is going to flow. It's not clear where money runs. It's not clear where the safe haven is. And that's a bad world to be in. If you don't know where the safe haven is, first, it's going to trigger a longer-term rethinking about reserve currencies, a longer-term rethinking about the anchors in the system. Um, but near term, I think it's a whole load of chaos and confusion. Absolutely. Well, you've been given two minutes to prepare your thoughts. No, no. Well, uh, uh, I think the, the Thurman said, said it right, that there is going to be a default premium uh, put on U.S. bonds. So part of the reason for the yield increase will be there's now a, a default premium. So expected yields may not go up so much. So in that sense, uh, there's not as much pressure on other countries because of the yield increase. I think the bigger concern is the freezing up of some markets. Uh, because U.S. collateral is no longer good, uh, you, the U.S. is no longer a safe asset. And that could create disruptions, which it's hard to foresee where it will extend. My sense is, from our side, we will still treat our U.S. reserves uh, US, uh, as, as good, that eventually uh, we don't expect the U.S. to default on its claims. We, do, we'll, we will look through it and see it as a technical default, uh, but not as an actual default. But that said, 
one does worry about liquidity of global financial markets when something like this happens, about collateral, about transactions, and that's worrisome. Let me go back one second to your earlier question about what's the reaction to unconventional monetary policy. To some extent, you can think of unconventional monetary policy as trying to uh, affect prices of assets. Uh, and typically we say you shouldn't uh, try and distort asset prices, but here it's okay because there are other distortions at work that you're trying to counter, for example, the zero lower bound. The question that emerging markets have is if you are distorting uh, asset prices on your side, uh, you've told us don't ever distort that, that primary asset price that faces you, which is the exchange rate. Never intervene, let it go wherever it will, because it is a bad thing to affect the exchange rate. Question I think that will come up and a possible answer to all this is people will say that maybe the countries that did affect the exchange rate are doing okay. And the countries that were willing to run large current account deficits are having a problem. And therefore the answer we take away is forget this global architecture, forget central banks ever in industrial countries adopting, uh, you know, these uh, thinking about these spillover effects and determining their policy, the right thing to do is every country on its own bottom, everybody focuses on minimizing current account deficits, global demand is lower, so what? At least we're safe. I think that place is a very bad place to get to. We could get there if we don't actually pay more attention to this issue. I mean, that is indeed the risk, and um, you're seeing some element of that already. I mean, you have been given a gold star by Christine Lagarde for your having, using your foreign exchange flexibility as a shock absorber. Um, are you convinced that's a good thing for you to do? I think we Would can you... use it to some extent, but I think beyond a certain extent, you worry about whether the financial markets have multiple equilibria. If uh, they think it can go a long way, you have effectively a bank run on your currency, and it can go much further than it should go. So I think uh, the, the Nostrum, let it go wherever it will, without uh, you know, trying to convince in a variety of ways that you want to put a stop to that is, is problematic. That said, early intervention is also problematic if you stop it from where it has to go to give yourself enough competitiveness. So there is, it, it's not as clean as let it, let it go. Uh, ultimately, you would not want to be in a position where there is you know, significant pressure on your currency either way. And I think, uh, unfortunately, countries going forward are going to see uh, the lesson from this kind of episode is when this money is sloshing around the world, that is the time to start building buffers of your own. Yes, absolutely. Well, we have time for a few questions, but since we only have time, for, only have 10 minutes, I suggest we t take three questions together. Um, it would be courteous but not compulsory to identify yourself, and please, please keep it short. We don't want any lengthy statements because we don't have much time. Question there and then question at the back. Uh, qu a question for uh, uh, Minister uh, Sean Mugaratnam, <laughs> excuse me for mangling your name, William Salter from Citigroup. My question goes to your comment about reserve currencies. We heard Christine Lagarde talk about how it was essential that Europe continue to pursue banking unity. Uh, my question is, is the world better served by having uh, Unipolarity or multipolarity with respect to reserve currencies, with respect to uh, how we manage things, whether it's in this city or in many cities around the world. Okay, that's a very good question. In a world that doesn't quite may not trust treasury bonds going forward, do you trust euro bonds? Ian Talley, Wall Street Journal. Hello. You talked about the uh, India not having, or most of its debt in rupees, but uh, is there adequate transparency on uh, corporate FX uh, exposure? Uh, is there a risk there that we should be concerned about, if I may, for uh, the IMFC uh, chairman? Is there, are, are there any plans or is there a need to develop a, uh, a better contingency liquidity uh, uh, tool uh, amid the current uh, crisis? Okay, and we'll take one more question over here, and then if we have time, take another, another three after that. Thank you. Arturo Porsekansky with American University. Uh, during the good years, both your countries uh, indeed intervened in the foreign exchange markets, built up reserves, and uh, I was wondering if now the wind blows in the opposite direction, do you propose any rules for uh, intervention in the opposite direction? Right. 
but great questions. Do you want to start with sure. the question of the euro? Sure. Well, uh, I'll take them together. They're all very yes. interlinked in a way. First, I think um, one way or another we are going to end up in a multipolar world, and the reasons for that have to do with the real economy rather than the financial economy. Uh, that's happened. It's shifting decade by decade. The U.S. will remain, I think, the largest economy in market exchange rate terms for quite a while, but you'll have major alternative centers of economic activity, particularly in Asia. The question is, how do we make sure it's a stable multipolarity and not an unstable one? And that depends on how we respond. How the U.S. responds in particular to what I talked about earlier, the fact that you have international spillovers coming out of domestic monetary policy, is very important. And how the emerging markets respond to something which we, we haven't adequately discussed perhaps, which is that global monetary policy carries global moral hazard. It doesn't just let Congress off the hook, it lets everyone off the hook. The fact is, during the years of very low interest rates and ample liquidity, governments in the emerging world generally and governments internationally lessened the pace of structural reforms and allowed fiscal deficits to build up and took their eye off credit bubbles in certain countries. That's moral hazard. And moral hazard is now globalized. It's not just single country moral hazard. So that's a, a Another point about how we respond in this globalized world. Flexible credit lines is um, a very interesting instrument that the fund has devised to be able to respond very quickly to liquidity needs. It's currently designed for very well-rated countries. And I think we do have to develop some form of, some equivalent of a flexible credit line for countries that are not as well-rated but, but still bankable. Finally, I think uh, Singapore has always had, well, since 1981, we've had a managed float regime. We've never believed that for a small and highly open economy that it makes sense to have a f completely free float of exchange rate. The transitory movements in exchange rates have permanent welfare-reducing effects, to put it uh, in technical terms. And we think that middle ground in exchange rate management between total fixity, which is a bad thing and leads to bouts of instability, and total flexibility, which, which has uh, costs that are too large for emerging markets to bear. That middle ground of managed floats of one form or another is, is a fairly sensible ground. Thank you. Governor um, Raja. Let me just take the last two questions. The uh, issue of India's corporate debt, yes, there are corporations that have external debt. Uh, we've tried to guide that external debt towards corporations that have foreign earnings. Uh, but of course, there may be corporations that do get into some difficulty. They will have to re renegotiate with their debt holders. I don't see that as a systemic issue. Uh, and uh, I don't, uh, that uh, a very small fraction of that debt goes through the banks, the Indian banks. So we don't have uh, similar problems to what other emerging markets had in the past, that uh, I don't see it as a banking problem directly. Um, I think also if you look at the bad loans in India, a lot of them are because of delayed projects. We have to get those projects back on stream, but these are not bridges to nowhere or, uh, or acres and acres of housing that will never be occupied. These are uh, power plants that currently haven't got permissions to open or to get the coal linkages that they need. Those are fixable problems that will generate revenues down the line. So NPVs are lower but it's not a total write-off uh, for these loans, unlike in some other situations. On the issue of reserves, I think we are very happy we have the reserves we have, because they have enabled us at least for some time to buy by time, uh, so as to get the other actions. Ultimately, the answer to, uh, to some of these concerns, external concerns, is to strengthen your growth, strengthen your fiscal uh, reforms, strengthen your financial sector reforms, so that the outside uh, basically can have no possibility of wondering about weaknesses. Uh, it requires a lot more action, uh, but you need time for some of those actions, especially when you suddenly get hit by financial market concerns. And I think our reserves have helped us. Uh, for example, we've taken oil demand uh, from the state-owned companies off-market. We'll bring them back uh, over time, but that has helped us reduce the pressure on the foreign exchange market uh, by taking that demand off-market. Right. I think we have time for one more question. Um, okay, two, Jacob and then right there. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Governor. Uh, you spoke about the uh, major challenge for India being return to growth. 
Uh, could you say where the bottlenecks to that are? Are they political? Are they financial and external? Uh, or are they economic and internal? Uh, I think short term. Sorry, do you want? Yeah, yeah, okay. Why don't you answer that and then one quick one from Jacob? Sh short term, uh, the problems are very fixable. They are implementation. Projects have got stuck because they need an environmental permission or they need a coal linkage. Government has to work faster and quicker. A process has been set up for doing that, uh, something called the Cabinet Committee on Investment. It has cleared something like $40 billion worth of projects. There's another $160 billion in the pipeline. If we do all that, we get growth from that going. Uh, the weather gods have been favorable. Monsoon is good. It means a big thing for India, even though we are only 15% of, of GDP is from agriculture. 50% of people live in rural areas with agricultural income higher. They feel more confident. They go out and buy. Rural demand is picking up. Tractor sales are going through the roof. And so that, that is something that will help. Uh, third, exports have picked up strongly, not just because of the, uh, uh, the um, depreciation. That, that's too recent to explain the pickup in exports. I think it's because partner countries are growing. Exports have started picking up. All three sources of, uh, of, of growth will kick in. Uh, in the latter half of the year, I think that will help us stabilize. Longer term, infrastructure, human capital, and regulation. We deal with all three. I have no doubt that uh, sustainable 8-9% growth is there. Okay, well sadly we have just hit one o'clock. Do we have time for, okay, okay. Come on. Yes. Okay, the last question. Thank you, Jacob Frankel. Since I'm the last one, one probably should have ended now with this optimistic note, but I will ask still a question. Some years ago, when the unconventional measures were introduced and the term unconventional was coined, the presumption was that it is unconventional, short-term detour that will bring us subsequently back to the convention. And nobody would have believed at the time that it will last so many years. Fast forward. Are we in a detour or are we now in a new paradigm that in three years when we sit here, are we going to again talk about tapering, the untapering because it is so disturbing or whatever? Who would like to def define what is now the new conventional? I mean, we, we should have learned from Japan's example that some of these policies last for a long, long time. Uh, and of course are continuing to last. I, I, I just fear that uh, we are trying to use a tool which may not have the effect that we desire that other measures, you've talked about this yourself, that perhaps the way to revive growth is more on the structural side and perhaps even targeted fiscal policy, that, that monetary policy may be a holding action, but to get it to be the primary engine of growth may be difficult, and if the other elements are not kicking in, we may be in, in for it for a longer time than we desire. Anything to add? So I think, you know, Raghu and I have a very similar worldview on this. Uh, it has always been... Uh, you know, one of the lasting precepts in thinking about central banking is that central banks and monetary policy uh, can't affect the path of potential output in a country. It can't affect real variables, but it can have a significant effect on nominal variables. Second, you can be quite effective in a crisis, uh, but you can't do very much beyond a, a short period, beyond a short, uh, a short crisis. The twist on what Raghu just said uh, is that uh, you may not just be buying time for fiscal adjustments and structural reforms when you go through an extended period of very low interest rates, whether conventional or unconventional monetary policy. Uh, there's also, on the other hand, a moral hazard. You might be uh, giving people more time than they need, that, that they just should have, to put in place structural reforms and fiscal reforms. So, and that's the, that's the moral hazard I was talking about. And that moral hazard, unfortunately, was globalized in this round. So, what's the lesson coming out of this? I don't think it changes the basic precept. 
the basic precept is central banks should focus on sharp distortions, sharp disruptions, and on nominal variables, and not think that they're answer to uh, a lasting structural problem. Right. What well, I must say, my main conclusion from listening to this discussion is that if Governor Rajan and Minister Tarman were running all the emerging market countries, and probably the developed world too, the outlook would be a lot calmer. But in the meantime, can I say a big thank you to both of you for answering the questions so openly, and um, look forward to the great rest of the day. And we could really have no one better than Governor Torillo to address us today. So I'm happy to introduce him to you. Thank you, Jim. So do you want to say anything? Any way you want. Okay. So, so let, me, let me just say a couple of things, because I think probably the most productive way to do this is for, for first Jim to ask me some questions, and I gather he's going to allow um, you to do so as, as well. Um, I, I, so let, let me just try to set the... Um, big picture a little bit. I would say that uh, with respect to the, to the uh, topic of your, of your conference here, the state of U.S. and global financial reforms, the basic uh, status report is that there has been a, a good deal of progress made, uh, certainly in the sense that we have agreed internationally and we have formulated domestically uh, important changes in capital and liquidity requirements. Um, in particular, those are, those are largely done but now being implemented. Uh, the areas that I would identify as most in need of continued attention are um, resolution, uh, continuing work on resolution, and particularly cross-border resolution, which includes an element of uh, total loss absorbency that is making sure that any firm that gets put into resolution will have the resources available uh, in form of non-short-term debt so that loss can be absorbed without costing the taxpayers anything. But as you all know, there's also a panoply of issues on the complexity of cross-border resolution. Uh, and, and then also in the short-term wholesale funding area. Uh, uh, any, any of you who have, who have noticed anything that I've been saying uh, over the last year, year and a half, know that this is an issue on which I continue to be focused. Uh, the um, uh, short-term funding, uh, securities financing transactions are in many important ways the lubricant of a, mod a, a modern financial system. But like many lubricants, they can become accelerants when things get hot enough. And that is, of course, the, the definition of what happened in uh, 2008 uh, it is a vulnerability that continues today, that is the runability of much short-term wholesale funding. Uh, the levels are down, obviously, from five and six and seven years ago, as one would expect in response to the crisis and the relatively muted growth that we've had since then. But there's no reason to believe that as uh, two things change, both the level of economic activity and the shape of the yield curve, that one will not begin to get, uh, once again, greater and greater dependence on or reliance on uh, short-term wholesale funding. And that is, is something which internationally and domestically is still in need of work. Uh, it requires careful work and it requires people to be very cognizant of unintended consequences on the efficient and smooth operation of productive uh, capital market activities, but that, that's the other area which I would identify as in, um, in, in need of a lot of focus over the, over the coming months. There's a, there's a broad agenda, as you know, but if I start going through that, I'm going to take up your entire 45 minutes. So I just want to let you get a sense of my priorities, uh, and then now maybe, Jim, we can talk a bit to get a sense of your questions and your priorities as well. you first as someone who's had a great influence in Basel is that on the odd occasions when I was invited there to Basel there was a group of 10 or a group of 13 uh, and they'd give me dinner and tell me as little as possible 
ask me as <laughs> ask me as many questions as possible, and then they would go into their meeting the next day, and it was made very clear that I was leaving at seven in the morning, uh, so that they didn't have to do anything to get infected by any views that I might have. Uh, then it's gone from that very small group, I think now, to over 20 countries represented. Uh, and I'm just wondering whether that uh, governance mechanism now works, because as I recall it, in those days you had a very tight team. Uh, you were operating as a unit. Uh, but when you go from 13 members to 20 plus, does it change the way we're being managed? Well, I think uh, it's a very astute question, Jim, and I think the answer is absolutely. Um, but, but let's begin by, I think, stipulating, or I would at least stipulate, that it was very, very important to bring into the Basel Committee and the Financial Stability Board uh, countries beyond that group of 13. The, theoretically, the G10, but in fact, as Jim said, 13 countries. Uh, in recognition of the fact that the number of uh, large, globally active, important financial institutions has increased and that the home countries for those institutions are beyond those, those uh, original 13 members of the uh, Basel Committee. So I, I think we should begin by stipulating how important it was, and not just we at the Fed, but all the U.S. agencies were very strong supporters of expanding the membership. Um, second point is, though, that as, as the question suggests, it does change the dynamic because, of course, it's not just uh, 28 um, member states or states that are represented there, but multiple agencies in many cases from each of the countries. Uh, so if you've, if you've been to that meetings floor at the BIS, you know, we've had to move from the smaller room into the bigger room for all of those <laughs> meetings. And as, as one who, in teaching, was very conscious of which classroom I was being assigned to because it had a basic effect on the, uh, on the dynamic of the class, so too I think it does have, a dyna it does have an effect on the dynamics of, of the committee. I'm going to come back to this in a second, but the third thing I want to say is, coincident with the expansion of the Basel Committee and the FSB, of course, was a refocus. You know, as many of you know, for some years, the Basel Committee was essentially focused on only one thing, which was Basel II. Uh, there, there were theoretically other things going on, but essentially that's all that was going on. In, as the, in the wake of the crisis, there was an enormous uh, imperative to take a broader look, to try to examine uh, flaws in existing regulatory um, arrangements, uh, gaps, in those arrangements, the impact of the shadow banking system, all of those things had become familiar to us. And as a result, the agenda expanded enormously, exponentially. So when you put together a big expansion of the agenda, the creation of the Financial Stability Board, which is really very different from its predecessor, the Financial Stability Forum, the expansion of the Basel Committee, the need to pull together finance ministries, securities, market regulators, bank regulators, all as one. There is growth in the number of people in rooms, but also a bit of a tendency to um, become more formal. I, I, I at one point in, in one of these meetings in Basel, I said, you know, I wasn't, I, I was beginning to think I'd gotten off at the wrong train station in Switzerland, and this was Geneva and the WTO, <laughs> rather than, rather than, uh, the Basel Committee, uh, the, the FSB. So I think it's going to be very important for us to do two things, two or three things, in streamlining the, the deliberative and um, uh, quasi-negotiating functions of the FSB and the Basel Committee. The first, and this is really important, is to integrate fully the, the new members. I mean, they've been members for three years now, but it's really important to move some of the um, officials from some of these new members into leadership positions, which, you know, we've, we're now doing. I mean, two, we have two of the four committee chairs on the FSB are from emerging market countries. 
uh, which I think is a highly positive development, both because the two of them are so terrific individually, but also because of what it represents. Uh, we can't have this sort of in-group and peripheral group. That is just the wrong way to have a success internationally. Second, I think, to, to be honest, those of us who are um, um, fortunate enough and, and being given responsibilities to try to play some leadership role need to be more proactive. And what I, I think we need to be doing a lot more than waiting for the bi-monthly meetings. Um, we need to be reaching out more. We need to be trying to develop views and, and consensus and new ideas and buy-in uh, on a more ongoing basis, as one would in you know, running a large committee or a board of directors or something of that sort. Um, the third thing, though, I think is we need to find, need to find a venue, a vehicle, for getting back to that original concept that Jim was alluding to. That not with the 12 countries or 13 countries as such, but with those individuals who have direct senior authority for supervising the largest globally active institutions. We need to make sure that they really do have an opportunity to regularly engage with one another informally without a lot of other people in the room. Because when there are a lot of other people in the room, you can't talk about the specifics of a particular financial institution. You have to stay general. You have to stay more at policy levels. If we do that, I think we're going to make some of the issues of international cooperation a lot easier to manage. Things like resolution plans and exchanges of information, which are hard to negotiate when it has to all be kind of written down and everybody wants to say, here are the precise <coughs> obligations, will be a lot easier to manage if there are these strong working relationships. So, so I think if we do those three things, we can take advantage of the enormous contributions that the new members have already made and will make, and at the same time have a, a manageable governance system that doesn't end up with always being in the biggest rooms on the, that um, uh, conference room level of, of, of the BIS and thus seem too much, too formalistic. Could I just ask one more question because uh, it, it uh, arose actually when I was at the bank and that was that until, give or take, the year 2000, you had 30 plus countries that had 80% of the global GDP. Mm -hmm and you had the rest of the countries having 20. And the 80% was about a billion people, and the rest was 5 billion. And now the projections are, and I'm not, I don't know whether they're right or wrong, but they're probably in the same direction. The 80% is likely to be between 35 and 40% of global GDP by 2050. And that you will have an Asia, most assuredly, with more than 50% of global GDP. It can be argued how much. You have China and India up there as one or three, uh, that the representation of other countries in the developing world will, or the, uh, the impact, uh, the financial impact is, will be greater than many of the old countries that had a greater impact. How do you see global governments adjusting? Do you ever see a time when there'll be a Chinese representative doing your job? Oh, sure. Oh, absolutely. Uh, I mean, I, I, um, I, I think that in this area, Jim, actually, we, we, we can be more of a leading edge in the financial regulatory area, as, by the way, I think is the case in a number of other regulatory areas, like competition authorities. And the reason for that is that while everybody is always a representative of their nation, and indeed, well, we in the U.S. are representative of the Fed, the OCC, or the FDIC as well, and don't you forget it, um, when even in international groupings, we all share the same mission, which is the safety and soundness of our financial institutions and the stability of our financial system. And I, I think, you know, one of the reasons I'm, I'm so intent on creating the kind of forum or venue I spoke about a moment ago is I think that'll foster the kinds of relationships that you never lose and shouldn't lose your national identity or identity as a Fed regulator or someone from the Chinese Bank Regulatory Commission. But you do share an overall mission of global financial stability, which is a global good for us all. 
So I, I absolutely think that we're going to evolve in that direction and that here, uh, this is one of the areas in which, as I say, we've already got um, a Singaporean and, and Mexican sharing important committees of the FSB. Uh, and I, I, I think that that's just going to continue and, and indeed it'll be healthy for us all as we move beyond this sense that someone of a particular nationality or representing a particular jurisdiction needs to stay in, stay in a job. But instead we say, well, we have all these resources and let's get these people in and give them a shot. Because these jobs are a lot of work. No one wants to do these for more than a couple of years. Seriously, you got a, you got a day job and then on top of that, you know, you've, you, you want to do the committee. It's important to have people who really do have the responsibilities chairing the committees. You don't want someone whose full-time job is chairing an international committee, but they don't have any authority at home. But that, that means it is, kind of a, it is kind of a drain, and we should share the burden. Can I ask you just one last question, since you mentioned that your period in academia? Yeah. Um, we have, this year, 200,000 young Chinese to come study in American universities. We have 105,000 Indians coming. We have 11,000 Americans studying in the United States, in China, and 4,100 studying in India. If we are going to have a global leadership, um, are we preparing it for it in our country? Well, that you know, that's been a it's been a chronic concern. I, I mean, something is seemingly prosaic, but as important as uh, acquisition of second languages of course. in the United States has long been has long reflected, I think, the, the, um, the limitations on our ability to fully understand uh, some of the di some dynamics abroad. And I, I, you know, at some level, I think it continues to be a very good thing for us and for the country that so many foreign students want to come here to study. I mean, I was blessed at both Harvard and Georgetown with having so many um, really good foreign uh, LLM students uh, they, they were usually a little older, grown-ups, you know, so that always made it uh, easier to teach. But also, uh, they, had, they had different perspectives. You can learn a lot. And they wanted to learn about the U.S. legal system. So I, th I still think that's a big advantage for us, uh, as well as for our, the, the revenue prospects of our universities. Um, <laughs> but I, I agree with you that we've got we've to have the reciprocal movement of people spending time uh, in formal educational settings abroad, uh, because otherwise we're we're going to our kids will be under the misimpression that the knowledge is is a one, one way, way flow as opposed to a two way flow. Well, let me see if there are questions here. I have another twenty down here that I could ask, <laughs> but I'm not going to ask them all. Let me see. If there are one or two questions here, yes, sir. And if you could identify yourself uh, when you do it. Thank you. I'm Arturo Porsekensky with American University. Governor, if I could get you to get off at Union Station. Um, some say that the seeds of the financial crisis that started in the summer of 07 were planted by Washington because banks were forced to lend to otherwise uncreditworthy people to buy their first homes. And then uh, the Fannies and Freddies lowered uh, their standards and uh, made those subprime loans conforming and, and they were turned into bonds and the rest is history. Some say also that all the regulation that's coming out uh, is, is basically to offset the, the wrong incentives being sent uh, from Washington. My question is, have you views on the housing finance system and what needs to be done to at least prevent fighting the last war again? So, um, so there, there, I have a couple of different views or responses which may seem to go in slightly different directions, uh, I, but I hope they end up being coherent. First, I, I don't, I, I've, ne I, I've never thought that the effort to assign uh, basic causality flowing from Fannie and Freddie to the financial crisis was, was a particularly convincing one. Uh, I mean, I, I, I think you have to step back further and say that the root of the problem was that we had moved over the course of 30 years or so 
from in, into a situation in which capital market activities and traditional lending functions had become highly integrated. The short-term wholesale funding that I mentioned in, in my brief introductory remarks uh, is an example of that. And that created a, a system that was vulnerable for many reasons. Everything from the opaqueness of the collateral that was backing the securities that, uh, excuse me, the securities that were part of the collateral that was in the repo and other markets, um, to the um, uh, existence of a shadow banking system that was not actually subject to the kinds of regulation that those who transform maturities are usually subject to. Um, there, there was just a host of byproducts of that basic movement which had eroded the New Deal regulatory system uh, as it had been eroded over time without substituting something new. So while I, I, I think that the potential role of the housing finance system is subject to debate of how much it was, I've never thought that it was convincing to say that's the problem. Now, having said that, if where we are today, of course, is in a circumstance in which essentially the only securitization of um, residential mortgages that has been done <laughs> since the onset of the crisis has been through Fannie and Freddie. There is some private label residential mortgage activity, um, but nothing like what one presumably would hope or expect. And this as, this as, for example, the auto loan securitization has can't come right back and is in a very healthy state uh, today indeed. And, and my own hypothesis is that uh, there are many reasons for that, um, so many of which have to, well, some of which at least will probably be solved as the housing market continues to strengthen, prices recover, um, but some of which I think are probably the result of markets waiting to see what happens with the GSEs. You know, what is, what is the longer term environment for uh, the government sponsored um, housing enterprise entities going to be? And I say that because um, even if, you know, if, if you say, well, gee, what, won't there be better business, aren't the good business opportunities that exist today going to surely be there in five years? That may well be true, but I, I suspect that some financial actors out there want to know, are they going to be able to be in some of the space that Fannie and Freddie are in today or not? Now, the answer to that, the actual answer to that may be less important than having an answer so that they then know what their business model can, can look like. Uh, and, and so I think that is very important. I think the second thing is that um, we don't, there, to, to, to say that there are abuses, both in terms of you know, uh, uh, bad underwriting of loans, origination and distribution of poorly underwritten loans, um, outright predatory lending, not just a question of bad underwriting, but predatory with respect to the homeowner, I mean, we know that all that was true, and we know that as a result, we needed and have, have implemented a variety of prudential and consumer protection requirements. Um, what I don't think anybody wants is a return to, you know, the 50s and 60s period in which we had very much a binary, what I would term a binary mortgage market. You're either someone who had really good credit, and a big down payment in hand, and you could go to a bank and you get a 30-year fixed mortgage at a good rate, or you weren't, in which case you're out of luck. So we, I, I, don't, I don't think, I hope, and I don't believe that anybody wants to go back in that direction, and I don't say that that's where we're headed, but I think that there's a risk that if we don't pay attention to um, the conditions, the cost, the expense of financial institutions making loans to people with less than pristine credit. And we don't pay attention to the issues, of, you know, putbacks from the GSEs, um, the standards we hold people to for delinquent loans, all of those things, that there is at least some risk that 
where we inadvertently slip back closer than we would probably think is optimal to that, to that binary situation. It won't be binary in the way it was 40 years ago, but um, we, we won't have the kind of, uh, uh, um, in a good sense, distinctions drawn among different kinds of credit risks with appropriately developed uh, uh, mortgages for them. Thank you very much. Uh, there's a lady right at the back. Hi, Pesmo Amani, uh, CG and the University of Waterloo. I'm wondering if you could reflect on the level of um, coordination between organizations like the FSB, the IMF, and Basel, and, and if you could reflect on what could be improved so that we don't have issues fall between the institutional cracks, so to speak. Yeah, so that's a good question. So the, the first thing I can say is when I walk into that, one of those big um, conference rooms uh, on the, on the the first, you know, first floor, but the one you have to walk up to when you get into the BIS. Um, the first, one of the first things you'll notice is about a third of the table, the, the little placards for everybody's um, identifying everybody, are representatives of some international organization or committee or something. So, you know, you got the fund, you got the bank, you got IOSCO, you got the Basel Committee, uh, you have the Committee on Global Payment Systems, you have the Committee on Global Financial Systems, and there, you have the OECD. I mean, there are a lot of people sitting there. So at some level, you might say, ah, no problem with coordination, everybody's represented there. Um, but, but of course, that doesn't, it, it doesn't quite follow, and I think your line behind your question is, um, the insight, the, the correct insight that uh, you, a multiplicity of organizations can create, it's, it, in theory it should say, oh, someone should cover everything, but it actually can create one or two and sometimes both of the following phenomena. One, one is that you have multiple organizations or entities trying to do the same thing. You know, everybody wants in on whatever the issue may be, uh, and financial stability, monitoring, and all that, that is a prime one, right? That's, that seems to have, because that one allows everybody to say, hey, we see problems out there, somebody should solve them, but listen to us, we see problems. <laughs> um, so, so that, you can actually have, a, it can be a little bit like the, you know, the five-year-old soccer game where everybody runs to the ball. Uh, and that, that can produce the second problem, which is, no one really paying attention or working on some of the less celebrated or less, at this moment, newsworthy stories um, or issues. And, and so I would, um, I would say that we've got some more work to do there, but I'm actually pretty sanguine about how this will come out. And the reason I'm more sanguine is I've seen, I've seen over the course of the last few years how we're starting to hit our stride between the FSB and the Basel Committee, the International Association of Insurance Supervisors, the IAIS, and IOSCO. Uh, three standard setters representing bankers, uh, bank regulators, insurance supervisors, and securities or market regulators. The, you know, there was a kind of tug of war that you could, you could anticipate at the outset, but I think now we're getting into a rhythm where people in the FSB understand that the expertise is really lodged in those committees. And that's where we're bringing together the people who have the actual domestic authority, but that the FSB really can serve a role as um, watching everything, suggesting where someone may want to do some more work, and being reassured that work is being done in a particular area. Um, I, I would say that, that uh, um, we probably have the probably more productive avenues for interaction with some of the other international organizations on this. But I at least, you know, I still see a very strong role for the fund, for example, because there are some things, there are some things that probably are not as susceptible to productive peer review, uh, like within the FSB or the Basel Committee, where the IMF, with its measure of, I mean, it's, it's a membership organization, of course, but it's got you know, much more of a organization, professional, career staff, who in doing things like Article 4 reviews, can provide an independent and comparative perspective yeah. on things like 
the independence of financial regulators in each country, uh, which the fund, for example, has done a report on. So I think if we work on that a little bit more and do a little bit more of uh, an acknowledgement that there are different comparative advantages for some of these different institutions, um, we, we can actually make some progress. The last thing I'd say is, uh, so one of the things I think is working well in the FSB is the relationship between the SGAB, which is, well, I may not get the initials right. It's, it's uh, Standing Committee on Assessing Vulnerabilities. I did get them right. Um, and, and it is what, it's, what it sounds like. It meets to try to pull back from the issues of the day and say, okay, where are broader vulnerabilities? Where are there, is where are there developments which may pose a problem? Um, Augustin Carstens, the Governor of Bank of Mexico, is the chair of that committee. And what, what we're now doing is, is when Augustin finishes a meeting or an analysis, he calls me and then sends me something which details their findings. And then we can take it up in my committee, which is the Regulation and Supervision Committee. That is the act, a committee that has people on it who can act. And then we can report back to the, to the SCAV of, of how we tried to dispose of these issues. And at the meeting we had here in Washington last week, I you know, got the report um, from Governor Carstens, and then we, the uh, uh, Committee on Regulation and Supervision, uh, or regulatory cooperation, I guess we call ourselves, we sat there and um, we said, okay, can the Basel Committee follow up on this one? Um, can we get IOSCO and a couple of the market regulators like the SEC and the FCA from the UK to follow up on this one and report back to us at our next meeting. So I, I, I think if we are all, um, if we all acknowledge one another's role and we actually go beyond that and say, yeah, you really are the lead on this, and the FSB really does try to keep its umbrella function of watching and coordinating, I think actually be a pretty good outcome. We don't want the FSB to try to become a super, super authority that does everything itself. Because um, A, I don't think that's feasible, and B, it'll just create a lot of bad feelings. Yes, sir. <laughs> William Salter from Citigroup. Uh, Governor Terullo, in the 1970s, I believe, uh, the national market system regulation was passed by Congress expressly required regulators to consider U.S. competitiveness as a factor as they developed regulations. Do you believe that in the pursuit of national competitive advantage is a valid goal of regulatory supervision? Well, I would say that it is a valid goal and certainly it is something that is relevant to us at the Fed as we engage internationally um, to think about the competitive position of U.S. firms. I mean, that, that's what I was saying a little while ago, that you neither, sh neither do nor should ever step out of your role as a national regulator, um, but that there is a collective interest in having international financial regulatory cooperation. And that collective interest is of two sorts. The first sort is just assuring global financial stability. You, you know, we, we in the United States um, need to have some assurance about financial stability of large banks from other parts of the world, and surely the rest of the world needs some assurance about the stability of our organizations and indeed our system more generally. So there's that shared interest, but there's also the, the shared interest of having a workably fair, workably, competitively equal regulatory system. Uh, the, the origins of Basel I were, were both of those elements, very much both of those elements. And I think you know, people, people shouldn't, shouldn't, with some sort of um, n nostalgia, think, oh, in the good old days, it was all just about uh, you know, safety and soundness. No, it wasn't. It was about safety and soundness, but as people may recall, we wanted, we meaning U.S. interests, wanted safety and soundness in the United States. Congress wanted capital regulation, but people understood that if it were only implemented in the United States, uh, then there may be a competitive disadvantage in those days with Jap dominantly with Japanese banks. So I think both of those aims need to be kept in mind. 
I would also say that if you, if you fa fashion a good set of arrangements, a well thought through set of arrangements um, that achieve that safety and soundness end and do it in a workably efficient fashion, you will have contributed to the having a roughly um, rough competitive parity. I, now, the last thing I say is I think everybody knows that no set of regulation, A, you're not going to harmonize absolutely, B, you shouldn't try to because you should allow for local variance, and C, there's a lot more than a regulatory system that affects the competitiveness of financial institutions from a particular country. But while acknowledging that, I still think it's the case that, that one keeps both of those aims uh, in mind, and one understands that happily you can pursue both, in most instances you can pursue both more or less simultaneously. And the last question, I think, is here. Yes, sir. Uh, Dino Coase from Southwest. So my question is about derivatives. And so the G20 agenda in Pittsburgh set out plans to move derivatives from OTC, opaque system, to exchanges, CCP settling, uh, reporting to trade repositories, and the like. So two questions. One is, how's it going? Are you satisfied with the progress? And how much more is there to go? Second question is, if it is successful and you have actually achieved, let's say, concentrating uh, risks in CCPs, how is the regulatory regime going to change? What needs to be done, in, you know, both here and elsewhere? Right. Good, good questions both. Uh, so on the, on the first, um, it, it is, and I think this was implicit in the way you phrased the question, it is a complicated undertaking to, to uh, do this and to do it in a more or less coordinated international fashion. I think we, you know, we have made um, a considerable progress, and I, I think you know, we're beginning to see the fruits of some of that progress, but it still needs a good bit of work, and these regular meetings we have, both in the FSB and in other venues, I think really are one of the, one of, here's a good way to put it. If you have, you know, sort of ad hoc meetings of senior officials from a number of different countries, as we periodically do, <laughs> the agenda will sort of look differently from, from uh, time to time, but derivatives are always on the agenda. And, and that tells you that it's something that um, is an ongoing and probably pretty complicated issue that needs to have the discipline of regular scrutiny from senior people to gauge progress and to, and to um, push forward uh, a little bit more. Uh, so uh, I, 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 you know, satisfied, I, I'd be happier if we were further along, but um, I think we've made progress, and I think most importantly, I think there's a generalized commitment to continuing to make progress. The second part of your question is really important because uh, many thoughtful obs observers have noted that as one moves more activity onto a, into a central clearing organization, or of course ultimately an exchange, but particularly the central clearing organization, at, there's, a, there's immediate benefit from th obviously things like netting and uh, clarity and transparency that comes with it. But one has to be cognizant of the fact that one uh, may be shifting or concentrating more risk as a result of that uh, migration into a single venue. That is, there may be less risk as a whole because of shifting onto the central counterparty, but it may be more concentrated. That recognition was reflected in Dodd-Frank, which, for example, which did uh, authorize the Financial Stability Oversight Council to designate as systemically important financial market utilities that play that kind of role. And as you know, uh, last year, the, the FSOC did designate a group of such utilities, which are now subject to um, um, more stringent supervisory oversight by their primary regulator. But of course, we, the Fed, if we're not the primary, we also uh, have a role to play. Uh, you, may, uh, you may also have noticed that the New York Fed just, I think it's last week, did a, did a conference on fire sales, the continuing fire sale issue, which, again, has can manifest itself in the context of a uh, single clearing organization, a utility, if you hypothesize that one important dealer participating in that 
market structure uh, has problems. How do you cope with the failure of that? And, and now that it's kind of concentrated there and everybody looks to the, I'm going to, instead of saying central clearing, just say FMU for short, the FMU to resolve it. So that, there, we've made an awful lot of progress on things like reduction of intraday credit exposure in, in uh, the tri-party repo market. We've moved a bunch of derivatives into central clearing. We're doing more. But all the positives then create a few different kinds of risks which need to be addressed. And that's, that's sort of the next item, I think, on the agenda for us, certainly as we at the Fed move forward with what I think has been terrific progress, actually, in tri-party repo. Dan, I want to thank you for several things. First, for your remarks today. Secondly, for your leadership at the Fed on so many of these issues. And most importantly, on the way in which you've transitioned to recognize the international aspects of these issues in such an effective way in Basel and elsewhere. So thank you for all those things. Thanks, Jim. Thanks very much. Nice to be with you today. Before we go to our next panel, our next two panels actually, I cannot let, we cannot let this opportunity pass without noting the fact that it is, it is the 30th anniversary of the Bretton Woods Committee. And if you can do the arithmetic, it means that we were founded in 1983. Why 1983? Well, we'll go back beyond that a little bit in history and uh, see how we got to that date. You will recall the Bretton Woods system, per se, was created after World War II in the 40s, and it survived for a couple of decades. But in the 70s, for a lot of reasons, uh, it, the, the system in the system in that case means referring to the foreign exchange system at that time, fixed as it was, was abandoned. And many thought following that period that uh, they wondered about the status of the Bretton Woods institutions per se. And there were many, there were many who thought that, well, their function was over. And really they should be diminished or even terminated. But in the 70s, the latter part of the 70s, beginning in 73 with the oil embargo, the petrodollar crisis came along, which eventually led to the Latin American debt crisis, and the world was in great turmoil for quite a while. Not that it isn't today, but that was a tough period. So, uh, even though there were many in this city, actually, who thought that there wasn't any need anymore for the fund or the bank, uh, it soon it was very clear that there had to be. In fact, Joe Fowler, Henry Fowler, who had been Secretary of the Treasury, would always say, if we didn't have the IMF and the World Bank, we'd have to invent them. So that's how it came to be in 1963. Joe and gathered a group of concerned citizens rallied around and created the Bretton Woods Committee. It's a private, nonprofit, nonpartisan, nonpartisan organization of concerned citizens who got together to demonstrate the value of international economic cooperation. Originally, originally, the committee was uh, basically focused on, uh, on, basically on relations with Congress. It was an American constituency who uh, were, in a sense, um, trying to convince con Congress of the value of the two institutions. That, that, that mission broadened considerably. But as you even saw this morning with Christine Lagarde uh, asked you all for your support and the committee in dealing with one of the crucial issues that faces the Bretton Woods uh, system again in terms of representation. 
on the governing body of the IMF. And uh, anyway, but that is an issue, and we often hear um, we get we're in touch we're in touch with the fund and the bank. We are not a lobby in any by any means. We are we are let's call it friends and thoughtful critics. The emphasis on thoughtful. We do our best to uh, to help and we criticize when criticism is called for. Anyway, subsequently to that period, going back a bit, we, uh, in view of the growth of, uh, of the, let's say, the, the global economy, the integration of it, we created an international council, which this is its uh, meeting, which is an integral part of the Bretton Woods Committee. Obviously, no longer can people in America say that uh, we are the only part of the economic um, global environment, by no means. During the history, we were privileged to have uh, many prominent and future policy makers, Presidents Ford, uh, Carter, H.W. Bush have been honorary co-chairs. Paul Volcker, Jerry Corrigan, Joe Fowler, Henry Owen have been co-chairs. And of course, today we also have Bill Frankel, who's with us now, as well as uh, our esteemed Jim Wolfenson. At least, I think, eight recent secretaries of the state and treasury have been members of this committee before they were appointed. And four of the last world, maybe five, of the last World Bank presidents have been members of this committee before they were appointed. It leads me to conclude that if you want to hold a high-level job in this government, <laughs> join this committee. Anyway, if you're not a committee member yet, and many of you are, I know, we thank you for your support and your potential support. We need it. We're a voluntary organization. As I keep saying, it's a lean and mean organization. Very small budget, but a lot of enthusiasm. And if you're not a member now, please see Randy Rogers, our executive director, and he'll pick your pocket. <laughs> As we look ahead, the committee will continue what we've been doing. And you may ask what we've been doing. Well, it, it comes to not, not just the, these kinds of meetings, but small seminars, symposia, getting together here and there with people, mainly in Washington, but also in New York and other places, to discuss issues that are of relevance to the Bretton Woods institutions. And in that connection, I do want to thank uh, our sponsors, particularly uh, Deloitte and Joni Swedlin, who was here a minute ago, but who was there she is, uh, for their great support of the committee over the years. They've been a strategic partner for us. And uh, I also must thank Barclays in two ways, because Barclays is now headed by Sir David Walker, who's with us now and who will be on the panel, actually. Um, but also, he has been a long-time committee member, long time. And that may, as I read that, if you want to be the chairman of a British bank, you should be the committee, <laughs> join the committee. <laughs> anyway, we'll, uh, oh, there's another thing that's important. And the cat's been out of the bag through our brochure. If you read it carefully, which some people do, uh, you'll see that there is a forthcoming change in the leadership of the Bretton Woods Committee. But this won't formally happen till the next spring meeting, the formal annual meeting of the committee. And the Honorable Bill Frenzel, who, is, who has been co-chair for many, many years, many years indeed, has decided it's time that he would rather be in an advisory role. And, uh, that will happen, 
Now, I could say a lot of things about Bill Frenzel, but we have to adjourn at 5 o'clock. And uh, we're going to leave that part of it till next spring. And I'm also happy to say, as you read your, if you read your brochure carefully, uh, the Honorable Jim Colby will be taking up uh, responsibility, responsibility, Jim, as a co-chair uh, of the Bretton Woods Committee. Again, we'll do that in the springtime. But if you don't mind, fellas, could you both stand up and wave to the crowd? Well, we'll celebrate then, but now we celebrate our 30 years, and we're really looking forward to the next 30 years. We'll all be around, I'm sure, almost sure, but um, we will continue doing the work that we're supposed to be doing and, and with your support, with your support and your interest. You've been a great bunch of people in supporting this group and supporting the Bretton Woods Committee. I thank you for that. Now, we turn into our next segment. We are on time. Governor Ortiz will head up the uh, next group of speakers, which is, in, which is a very eminent group. And we will continue on a roll as we have been. Okay, uh, the, um, the session's title is uh, Share, Sharing, um, Shaping, I'm sorry, Shaping the Future of the Global Economic System. <laughs> so uh, it's an easy thing to do. And uh, as usual, you can uh, look at the state of the world with different glasses, you know. If you, uh, you want to see the world uh, half full, you can say that, uh, you know, despite the uh, very strong fiscal adjustment, the U.S. economy is growing around 2%, 2 percent, 2 and a half percent, that uh, after two years, Europe uh, seems to be out of the recession. Uh, Japan is growing at the highest rate uh, in many, many years. China has apparently uh, stabilized. But if you want to look at it with glasses that show you it's half empty, you can say, well, the U.S. may default uh, in a couple of weeks or have to, uh, have to balance the budget uh, from one day to the next. Uh, the uh, gap between uh, the European periphery and the core is reducing at a very, very slow pace. Uh, the drama of youth unemployment and so on is, is huge. Um, emerging markets are facing the withdrawal uh, of extraordinary uh, easy monetary conditions, and it's very easy to get addicted to liquidity eh? in, in many ways, but uh, the monetary liquidity is a special difficult addiction, uh, and so on. So uh, to, to guide us in uh, shaping the future of the global economic system, we have a, a stellar panel here. Uh, we have Governor uh, Kuroda from uh, the Bank of Japan, uh, Dr. Uh, Farid Amubarak, uh, who is the uh, governor of the Saudi Arabian Monetary Authority, had the privilege of being a very good friend of your two predecessors. Uh, Mr. Colm uh, Keller, chairman of Morgan Stanley uh, International. And of course, uh, Sir David Walker, who is uh, chairman of Barclays. So without further ado, mm -hmm. Chairman Kurada. Yeah, thank you. Um, Would you like to use the podium or? Uh, I, I, yeah, I can. <laughs> It is, uh, of course, my great pleasure to take part in this uh, wonderful meeting as a panelist today. Actually, when I first look at the list of questions prepared by the committee to shape uh, my remarks, I was 
really amazed by the sheer number and scope of the questions. This points to the fact that we are surrounded by daunting challenges in this interconnected world, and it is our joint responsibility to squarely meet these challenges. Given the time constraints uh, today, my focus will be naturally on monetary policy. Steering of policy has become increasingly difficult in recent years, and many of my fellow central bank governors have found themselves in uncharted waters. Since the outbreak of the Lehman shock, major central banks around the globe have introduced unconventional monetary policy measures, including asset purchases uh, <clears throat> amid uh, the constraints of a zero lower bound for nominal interest rates. The Bank of Japan itself has also implemented unconventional monetary policy several times since more than a decade ago <coughs> and has successfully accumulated ample experience. However, we have not been successful in conquering deflation. To this end, in April, immediately after I became the governor of the BOJ, we introduced quantitative and qualitative monetary easing, or I should say the QQE. The QQE is markedly different from the policies the BOJ implemented in the past and from unconventional monetary policies other central banks have been carrying out. Japan's economy, as you may know, has been mired in deflation for the past 15 years. In the meantime, people's inflation expectations declined under the cognition that prices will not increase or rather will decline, namely, uh, deflation expectations became entrenched. Amid the situation of prices not increasing, the holding of cash or deposits became a better investment, and thus farm, farms and households hoarded cash and did not make other productive investment. Persistent deflation encouraged behavior to stay status quo, and this deprived Japan's economy of vitality. There were, of course, phases of economic recovery in the meantime, but they did not lead to a sustainable increase in prices. The Phillips curve, which shows the relationship between the output gap and the inflation, shifted downward in tandem with a decline in inflation expectations. The average inflation rate envisaged when the economy is at an average state has been around zero for the past 15 years or so. Those in the other six G7 countries have been anchored around the inflation target of 2%. The largest problem for Japan's economy is that prices will not increase even if the level of economic activity rises. Therefore, the greatest challenge is to raise inflation expectations. Based on this recognition, as I said, the BOJ introduced the new monetary policy framework called QQE in April. This new policy aims at increasing inflation to the global standard of 2% by working directly on inflation expectations. Specifically, the policy complies two features. First is to show the BOJ's determination that it would overcome deflation at the earliest possible time through a strong and clear statement. Therefore, the period in which the BOJ will achieve the target was clearly specified as about two years. The second feature <coughs> Uh, was to launch massive monetary easing that clearly differed from the past policy. Specifically, the BOJ declared that there would be a doubling in two years of the monetary base that it provides. As a result, Japan's monetary base uh, two years from now on 
uh, will become 270 trillion yen or 2.7 trillion dollar, reaching more than 50% of nominal GDP. This ratio is 20% for the US and 23% for the UK. As the BOJ will double the holdings of Japanese government bonds, long-term government bonds, on its asset side while increasing the monetary base, the QQE also aims at putting strong downward pressure on long-term interest rates. The core mechanism of the policy is to raise inflation expectations and contain long-term interest rates. Under the BOJ's clear commitment and the new phase of massive monetary easing, inflation expectation will be raised while an increase in long-term interest rates will be contained through massive purchases of JGBs. As a result, real interest rates will decline and this will create stimulative effects for economic activity. Six months have passed since the introduction of the QQE. In Japan's economy, real GDP has marked annualized growth of around 4% for the last two quarters, and the CPI inflation rate, excluding fresh food, fresh food turned positive in June, accelerating to plus 0.8%. The outlook for economic activity and prices has improved and stock prices have risen by more than 30% since the beginning of the year. While these should be factors that lead to increases in long-term interest rates, Japan's long-term interest rates have declined from above about 0.8% at the beginning of the year to less than 1%. 0.7%. These rates have declined since end May, even in a situation of long-term interest rates in the US and many other countries having substantially increased across the board. The break-even inflation rate and expected inflation rates judged from various surveys have been increasing. Thus, the QQE has been exerting its intended effects, and Japan has been steadily moving toward overcoming deflation. But this QQE is an unprecedented policy in that it aims to increase inflation expectations in a situation where there is no room to further reduce nominal interest rates. While this is a daunting challenge, uh, development thus far have been encouraging. With the aim of achieving the 2% price stability target, the Bank of Japan will continue with the QQE as long as it is necessary for maintaining that target in a stable manner. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon, and thank you very much for inviting me uh, to join this prestigious uh, forum. The subject of our discussion today is a, a complex one, and my remarks will cover briefly uh, some, point, uh, some main points. I will review the current status of financial reform, their impact on global economy, the problem of how to achieve consistency of regulation across borders, the implication of the monetary policy uh, framework and the challenges ahead. Sometimes there are big uh, per diem shifts in the financial world that are caused by crisis. This is what happened in 2008 and revealed that the financial, the finance was globalized while regulation was inadequate, largely because it had remained at a local level. Light touch local regulation and or self-regulation allowed some of the biggest banks, the so-called GCFIs, to take high risk in return for high short-term compensation in return. There was perception among uh, bankers that the event of, in the event of crisis, 
mega financial institutions would be bailed out by taxpayers. Today, five years after the crisis, re-engineering the financial system is still a work in progress. While ultimate purpose of the of restraining excessive risk taking by bankers. Basel III is a vehicle for uh, this, and it is a major step forward in designing properly regulated global financial system. However, the true value of Basel III is when it is implemented by all countries, or at least the G20 members, who represent 80% of the global economy and approximately 90% of the financial markets. Implementing Basel III across countries will offer consistency among different jurisdictions and would severely limit regulatory arbitrage. It will, fit, it will fill the gaps and sort out the overlaps in global financial regulatory regime. In Saudi Arabia, we were Basel II compliant since 2005, and uh, this year, in January 1st, I announced that all our banks are compliant with the uh, requirement of Basel III. Uh, this has helped our banks to survive uh, many crises, uh, both uh, regional and international. The current financial reform will benefit the world economy in two ways. They will certainly reduce volatility in world worth in the world growth by lowering the probability, probability of major financial crises. They will also help the balanced develop, uh, uh, development of individual countries. According to a BIS research, policy maker, makers understand that a large, rapidly growing financial sector is not necessarily conducive for the real economy because it competes with, with the rest of the economy for scarce resources. We need a stability-focused financial system serving the need for real economy. For example, emerging markets, uh, emerging economies have relatively underdeveloped financial uh, sectors, yet they have historically had strong economic growth rates, especially in the recent history. The benefits to global economy will not happen without some pain during this transition. Banks are deleveraging as a result of changes, and this will affect the flow of funds into the emerging market economies. This may cause short-term challenges to some of those economies, especially those with worsening current account deficits. The crisis have proved that the price stability alone is not guarantee for financial stability. The monetary policy to, uh, toolkit needs to be wider to address both price and financial stability mandate so that both can be achieved. Central banks are under intense scrutiny for their policy action and clarity of communication. Quantitative easing is an emergency monetary policy. It has resulted uh, in unintended consequences for emerging market economies through a spillover effect, and hopefully it will be withdrawn in a major way to avoid disruption to the financial markets. The IMF Managing Director, Madame Lagarde, during the G20 summit in uh, St. Petersburg recently, uh, correctly called for the need for communication and coordination among central banks, both in advanced economies as well as emerging market economies. While I agree with this uh, call, especially as unconventional monetary policy becoming predominant, it will be challenging to execute such coordination. Central banks are mandated with the domestic objectives uh, toward price stability, employment, and financial stability. With such domestic agenda, it may be challenging for local authorities to also be responsible for spillovers to other countries that may suffer from unintended consequences of unconventional monetary policies. However, the call for communication and coordination is still valid and important when we should try. Under both the BIS and FSP, we have sufficient forum to facilitate such communication. We just need to make it more effective and more frequent. It is important that we continue our effort in implementing Basel III and continue fine-tune its sub-regulations to further help identify and better manage uh, risk that large financial institutions may face in the future. Bank stress tests should be tough and stressful enough to be viewed as credible. It is too early to judge the predictive value of stress tests, but they should 
at least identify weak banks. In conclusion, we have moved from fairly simple model of the global financial system to one that is both complex and more realistic. Much work has, need, uh, has been done, but there is still much to do. I am reminded of the saying that in theory, theory and practice are the same thing, but in practice they are different. The new regulatory framework should not be taken as a static set of standards. It will continuously evolve to cope with the newly challenges that may arise. Thank you very much. Is it good? Oh. Thank you. <clears throat> good afternoon, and thank you, uh, Bretton Woods Committee. In the five years since the financial crisis, governments, regulators, and banking organizations have all worked together to develop appropriate safeguards to stabilize the financial system and prevent future crises. As a result, today, the financial system is safer, significantly better capitalized, and more liquid than prior to the crisis, and funding, certainly for investment banks, is now largely on a secured term basis, addressing the earlier issue of the vulnerability of short-term funding for banks. The improvement in US banks capitalization and balance sheet liquidity reflects an institutionalized change in model that is significant and continues to evolve as well as prudent regulatory oversight. These steps were being taken even before the implementation of Basel III in the United States. When implementation began, in, with, when implemented beginning in 2014, Basel III will further strengthen the capital requirements applicable to and the systemic resiliency of US banking organizations. In addition to imposing higher capital levels and more stringent capital standards, jurisdictions around the world are developing broader reform measures to address areas such as liquidity, central clearing, margin requirements for cleared and non-cleared derivatives, as well as large exposures and concentration risk. Five years ago, banks operated under a model orientated around revenues and driven by leverage, whereas in the current environment, the model has shifted to one focused on risk-adjusted returns and PBT. This is a huge change in mindset. However, while much progress has been made to make banks safer, regulation itself has become a very complex tool. Today's regulatory agenda requires that bank banks solve for multiple vectors, risk-based capital, leverage, liquidity, stable funding. And this is within a myriad of competing legal rules where the definitions, calculations, and timetables for implementation vary. And in my opinion, <clears throat> there is a risk that national regulatory agendas can compromise good global practice and regulatory harmonization. The ghost of Lehman still looms large. There are a number of specific examples I would like to highlight. Risk-weighted asset calculations, which vary across jurisdictions. In July, the Basel Committee conducted a benchmarking exercise comparing the risk weight calculations across 32 global banks. The results showed considerable variation across banks in calculating the average RWAs for credit risk, indicating that reported capital ratios for banks could vary by as much as 20%. Never mind the disparity between model approval and self-certification in different jurisdictions. The Volcker Rule, Vickers, and Lichenen, assuming it is progressed, are driving slightly different permutations of banks, which is likely to have an impact on lending to the real economy. The revised Basel III leverage ratio has raised concerns about consistency. Industry associations have estimated that under the new proposal, the leverage ratio would become the binding constraint in capital management for the majority of US globally significant banks. Again, potentially impacting business activities that further real economic growth. Some of the potential consequences are that this ratio in isolation could actually incent banks to hold riskier assets as leverage rather than risk becomes the binding constraint. It could discourage banks from holding high levels of liquidity this in itself will conflict with the Basel Committee's own liquidity coverage ratio. 
It could increase corporate funding costs because credit is not given for netting and therefore there are higher capital charges. And the proposal requires capital to be held versus undrawn credit facilities, which by definition will lead to a reduction in credit to the broad economy. That's before we even talk about the impact on US treasuries, reverse repos, and everything else, which are part of the denominator argument. My point is that regulatory regimes should complement and support one another in addressing idiosyncratic and systemic risks, with the goal of promoting a well-designed, consistent, and coherent global regulatory framework, surprise-free, and a framework of certainty for us to operate in. Too big to fail remains an extremely important policy area as it pertains to the health of the global financial system. It should not necessarily be about an institution size, but rather recognize and understand the magnitude of a potential failure. This can be amplified when markets, firms, and regulators do not have time to react in an orderly manner. The key to avoiding taxpayer-funded solutions is to ensure that firms have credible resolution strategies and that regula regulators cooperate. Now, much has been achieved across the spectrum of too big to fail, including higher capital, more durable liquidity, and a stronger asset quality. Extensive work has been done by the authorities in the US, the UK, and the European Union to enhance recovery and resolution planning for large global banks. The US has largely finalized its resolution regime for systemic banks by adopting the OLA under the FDIC. The European Union is in the process of adopting similar measures under the Bank Recovery and Resolution Directive. However, there is much more to be done, and we fully support the FSB's efforts in driving cooperation and further consistency. However, neat packaging and resolution ignores relevant interdependencies in a global financial institution. Here is an example of where even more global regulatory cooperation will help. Clearly, there is a long road ahead for regulation of the financial industry. The debate around the right degree of stringency, the timing of implementation, and the very detail of each proposal will continue. But while governments, regulators, and banking organizations continue to work together through this complex agenda, we cannot lose sight of our absolute priority to do everything we can to support the global economy. Part of this support comes from the integral role that banking organizations play in the economy. Banks provide products and services to a large and diversified group of clients, including corporations, governments, other financial institutions, and individuals. This ranges from loan and cash management services for small businesses to providing access to the capital markets, mergers and acquisitions, restructurings. There has been recently a very interesting business roundtable paper which addresses the value that banks bring to the economy. Today, the vast majority of lending in Europe comes via the banks, whereas you know in the United States, the vast majority of lending comes via the capital markets. And with the European zone, or the Eurozone, being in deleveraging mode, there is an intrinsic uh, conflict in terms of trying to jumpstart an economy. In Europe alone, there has been more than $2.2 trillion in cross-border bank lending reduced since 2008. And lending to corporates is now the lowest it has been since any time since the Lehman collapse. Policymakers, regulators, and legislators need to prioritize the opening up and deepening of capital markets for the long-term funding of infrastructure, project finance, social housing, municipals, and the like. In Europe, this is most acute, as Solvency II hinders the insurance industry's ability to play more than a niche role in buying long-dated credit. <clears throat> Equally, Basel III potentially inhibits banks' ability to offer very long-dated finance cost effectively and efficiently. There have been some good rays of light. The recent announcement that the securitization rules may be re-looked at by the Basel Committee is a positive development, but we await details. In conclusion, the global economy is clearly recovering. Developed economies are re-accelerating. Emerging market economies are stabilizing and global growth is expected to trend at 3.5% next year. In the aftermath of a credit bubble, however, growth tends to be sluggish and not without hurdles. Resources need to be reallocated between sectors, and the ability to adapt differs greatly across markets and economies. Banks play an important role in facilitating growth, but they must have a much more consistent regulatory framework governing their capital and liquidity requirements, as well as policy certainty in which to operate. 
Thank you. Thank you. The, the very short version of my speech will be to say that I agreed with virtually everything that my uh, very good friend Colm Keller said, but I think it's so important that it's worth having a go at saying it in my own terms. As uh, the Governor of Sama reminded us, we all know that price stability uh, doesn't guarantee financial stability. Uh, I want to suggest, and I don't think it needs much emphasis here, that financial stability, uh, where we're in much better shape than we were five or six years ago, certainly does not assure that we have a financial system that will be adequately supportive of growth. The focus of macro prudential and institutional supervision over the past quinquennium has rightly been on boosting the robustness of the system and reducing the likelihood of disruption caused by failure in any major financial institution. And I'd say that against those objectives, much of the heavy lifting has now been done. But I want to draw attention immediately to two issues that threaten to constrain the capacity of major banks to discharge our critical intermediary role in support of economic activity. The first stems from extraordinarily national differences in accounting definitions and regulatory interpretation that create an unlevel playing field and risk stimulating regulatory arbitrage. For example, I'm aware of at least four, I think there may be more, different definitions of leverage now being used by the Basel Committee, the Swiss regulator, the PRA in the UK, and the Federal Reserve in the US. For some banks, the leverage ratio halves or doubles, depending on which definition is used. Such differences matter greatly now, given that while leverage ratios originally were expected to be more of a check and balance, a backstop, in practice, once, as we now have, a leverage ratio target is formally set, it quickly becomes a front stop for many banking groups. The second and still more serious issue is that of financial fragmentation or balkanization, which once underway is difficult to stop. The associated trapping of capital and liquidity was well described by Mario Draghi as a collective action problem. For each country individually, uh, such protectionism leading banks to withdraw their activities within national boundaries may be seen as making sense. It is collectively very damaging. Quantification, of course, is difficult, but for the European bank sector, a crude estimate of the scale of trapped capital is approximately 100 billion euros, some 6-7% of the total capital base of European banks. The figure for major banks globally will almost certainly exceed twice uh, that amount. This protectionism gives comfort to national politicians who can feel that their taxpayers are thereby insulated from failure. But the same insulation could be achieved without such fragmentation if there were sufficient, a word I want to emphasize in these remarks, to enable national governments and regulators to proceed alternatively on the basis of agreed recovery and resolution plans working cross-border. These issues were very well recognized in the FSB report to the recent G20 meeting in St. Petersburg, and the statement issued after the meeting reiterated the ultimate goal of building, and I quote, an open and resilient financial system that supports sustainable and balanced growth. But these are just words and aspirations. In the meantime, the cost of pervasive mistrust in the system is, in my view, very large. The most significant positive would be early international agreement on single or multiple point of entry resolution, which would greatly mitigate, if not eliminate, the perceived need for these protectionist arrangements. The recovery and resolution directive shortly to be promulgated in Europe ought to be a good start. Without such progress, the verdict seems to me inescapable that major banks will be materially inhibited in discharging their core intermediary role in support of global 
economic growth. But the complexities inevitably involved in reaching international agreement are compounded by major na national differences, Colin Kelleher referred to them, that are now emerging in regulatory structures. Three stand out, relate to the proposals of Volcker, Vickers and Lickenon, on all of which major banks await clarity and specificity, which is slow in coming. Beyond their continuing preoccupation with regulatory uncertainty, a sort of sword of Damocles hanging over certainly the world's CIFIs, a characteristic of equity and bond markets and of the analyst community over the past few years is their increasing disregard for transitional timelines that are proposed for new regulation with the expected impact of new measures priced in more or less immediately. The common market expectation, I suggest, is now that regulatory outcomes will tend to the hardest or worst case in terms of impact. And I have to say, kind of asymmetrically, that it would seem unrealistic to expect that the impact of agreement on new measures, prominently including recovery and resolution, will yield the intended benefits until these have been demonstrated on a through the cycle, on a through the cycle basis. So the Hall of Progress is set to be long. I don't underestimate the complexity of the regulatory task, but just as regulators rightly assess on a continuing basis the perform performance of major institutions within their charge, there are also criteria to be applied to the regulatory process and to the behavior of supervisors. This is not to question the clear prerogative and responsibility of the regulator to specify appropriately tough requirements, which will often not be in line with the preference of banks or financial markets. But I have in mind two tests of the regulatory process that are, in my view, critical to its success going forward. The first is that, to the maximum extent possible, new regulatory initiatives should be surprise-free and should stem from a relationship between regulator and regulated that's based on mutual trust and respect. Without the assurance that such a relationship provides to a board and to a bank shareholders that its strategy is not at needless risk of being disturbed by wholly unforeseen regulatory shock, the development of bank strategy will be at least an imperfect process, potentially involving real cost. I hope that the development of such relationships, I have to say sadly not always uniformly achieved hitherto, will be a clear priority for all regulators going forward. The second test relates to disclosure. While an important objective of the new macro prudential supervisory arrangements now in place in the US, the UK and the EU and in other uh, financial capitals is to provide regular assessments that might serve as, so to speak, preventive medicine for institutions and markets. Messages that are communicated insensitively can be damaging and counterproductive, in particular, and confidence of bank shareholders in the bond market. There's a clear role for public communication delivered appropriately to the whole market, but it should be altogether exceptional for guidance or comment on an individual institution to be delivered other than confidentially to that institution. I'd respectfully urge greater regulatory attentiveness to this in the future. It's not always been present in the past. In this context, it's particularly important that the result of stress tests and asset quality tests that are eventually to be published should be communicated to individual banks well ahead of publication to the market. I want to conclude with a proposal. It relates to uh, a, a, a reference made to the situation in Europe by Colin Kelleher. I want to conclude with a proposal that the promotion of an en enhanced capital market option, in particular for SMEs, should become an explicit policy priority. In Europe and in other parts of the world apart from the United States, the provision of credit to SMEs flows largely from the banks. The new regulation we've been discussing will materially 
constrain the capacity of banks to lend as economic recovery gathers pace. And bank lending is in any event now typically of much shorter maturity than could be provided by longer term institutional investors if appropriate instruments and channels could be put in place. Banks will necessarily continue to be the main originators of lending to SMEs, but there's now opportunity and need to develop capital market activity through boosting securitization, a market that in my view needs uh, as a matter of urgency to be uh, reignited. An understandable inclination after 2008 was to treat all securitization activity as a generic toxic phenomenon, and this was in degree reflected in the 2009 Basel rules that substantially increased the relevant risk weights. In this context, we may hear more of it in the next session, the re recent indication by Stefan Ingvers as chairman of the Basel committee that his committee might be ready to ease capital requirements in respect of retained tranches of SME lending could provide very welcome support of more vanilla securitizations of high quality diversified assets. I hope that this might be complemented, as indeed it will need to be, to be effective, by similar easement for European insurers under the Solvency II regime, to which the FSB uh, could give uh, impetus. Separately, but importantly in this space, efforts by the Association of Financial Markets in Europe to promote standardization of terms and documentation on SME loans should be further positive ingredients in the development of this market. The analogy I take is the huge standardization initiative done by ISDA in respect of derivatives 25 or 30 years ago. Given the massive economic costs associated with the 2008-2009 crisis, it's been wholly appropriate that regulators closely attentive to and driven by domestic political pressures have required substantial strengthening in the foundations of banking. But with much of this achieved or within sight, the need is now for a new settlement, I suggest, for which the necessary condition will greatly improved relationships of trust both among regulators internationally and between regulators and boards. With such a settlement, banks will be able to re-engage fully in their key role of intermediation. This is complemented by restoration of sound securitization processes. So to the co-chairman and the council of the Bretton Woods Committee, I hope that discussion leading towards such a new settlement might be encouraged under the independent and authoritative auspices of this committee and of the International Council. Thank you all very much. <laughs> Unfortunately, uh, Governor Kuroda has to uh, take a leave, so uh, we will uh, thank him for his presentation and wish him all the best. So let me uh, let me open the floor for questions, please. Uh, good afternoon. My name is Frank Vogel with Vogel Communications and Transparency International. Um, because the title is shaping the global economy, uh, let me, if I may, go a little bit to my question beyond financial stability per se. There's been a lot of discussion about obviously the need for financial stability and obviously the need for growth. But the other key element that is of great concern could, is that of inclusion. Uh, how do you as members of the panel and, and moderators views would be greatly appreciated too. Uh, recognize the issue of adding to inclusion. We have seen increasing income inequality we have seen millions of people out of work, uh, who remain out of work, uh, in Europe and elsewhere. Going forward, how do you see this new, 
the approaches that are necessary to ensure that growth moving forward is also inclusive growth. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Uh, I think this is a very important topic and uh, uh, the Financial Stability Board uh, consider it as a major topic going forward. Uh, three issues, financial inclusion, uh, consumer protection and financial literacy. These are very important topics that always been discussed and uh, there are many working streams to further develop them. There have been studies that show uh, correlation between the higher the inclusion of the different elements of the society, the more development there will be. And now regulators, uh, we in uh, the Central Bank in Saudi Arabia, uh, make it as a measurement and one of the indicators that we look at uh, how many we are including of the different groups in the society, uh, the poor, the rural, the women, uh, the unemployed, because the more literacy and the more understanding of financial products and financial investments, uh, it will help educate them to be included. And it is a very, very important uh, for all of us to work hard for it. I know my other colleagues in central banks also consider it as a major role for the uh, supervisors to make sure that uh, commercial banks uh, and other financial institutions do have these parts and make it affordable services where uh, small consumers, uh, small clients should not be charged uh, very, very highly in order to absorb them into the financial system. Thank you. <clears throat> would you like to make a point? Well, I, I would want to say a couple of things. One, if you like, positive. One, uh, negative. Uh, very supportive, uh, Frank the concern you express about inclusiveness. It's my impression that, certainly in the case of my bank, but I think uh, many, if not all banks, are greatly concerned to have programs of, let me use the collective noun, responsibility in the way they behave uh, in respect of their uh, societal objective and commitment. And I think there's a growing realization in bank boardrooms that without that, uh, the hostility that's been displayed to banks, in particular in the wake of the 2008 crisis, will uh, persist indefinitely. So I think we all have uh, an inclusive or responsibility agenda. One thing I would say, however, slight, a, a little prompted by the Governor's uh, remark about uh, protection of individuals through the sales of appropriate products, sales practices, appropriate products, Certainly in the UK, but I suspect elsewhere. One problem that we're encountering, and this is the negative point, is a consequence of tougher and tougher conduct of business regulation designed to protect the individual, is that some products uh, cease to be attractive as a commercial proposition to deploy in the marketplace. And the particular problem is that if the regulator has the capacity without a statute of limitations to go back and to apply penalties in respect of sales practices that were five, six, seven years ago, which may have been acceptable then but aren't now, uh, there is uh, at risk a process of depriving people who may be at the bottom of the social pile of simple savings products, for example, which are very important and necessary for them to have. Uh, let me just add a, um, a thought on this subject. And paradoxically, in uh, many countries that have low financial inclusion, you know, where financial penetration is low, have the paradox of uh, certain sectors of the population all, you know, getting over indebted and uh, suffering uh, many of them in connection with the development of microfinance and uh, the very high interest rates that are charged by these financial intermediaries. So uh, there is a, a, a problem, you know, in the emerging market world on how to make financially inclusive, let's say, uh, uh, less unequal, you know, and, and trying to uh, 
to really bring people into the financial sector in a positive way. But another question? There. Good evening, I'm from Bloomberg News, and my question is for the uh, Saudi Central Bank Governor. So, Saudi Arabia has about $700 billion in foreign assets, including more than $500 billion invested in foreign securities, which makes you a, a, a prime candidate to be vulnerable to the, the crisis that we have right now with the U.S. shutdown and, and the debt ceiling. What are your views on that? Do you, do you, do you, view, do you think that it's going to be resolved and you still view the treasury market as, as a safe haven, a place to invest your, your, your securities? Uh, also, domestically, your interest rates or your monetary policy is tied to the, because of the dollar price and because of the oil. Uh, so you've seen credit growth at about 15%, 16%. What macroprudential tools do you have to control the side effects of this in terms of inflation or, or in terms of uh, really fast credit growth? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, for the first question, uh, we are uh, long-term investors, and our long-term view is positive uh, on the U.S. I think this uh, uh, current uh, crisis uh, uh, will uh, go away, and we think its effect is uh, not uh, 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 lasting on our investments uh, here. Uh, as far as uh, our uh, 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 policies, monetary policies in Saudi Arabia, there are other tools that are available to us uh, in Saudi Arabia, uh, such as uh, uh, cash management, uh, capital adequacy uh, controls, and other uh, micro uh, and macro prudential uh, rules that help us uh, implement our monetary policy. Thank you. Please. Hi, Basma Omeni. I have a question to yeah. the- uh, Can you identify yourself, please? Basma Omeni, professor at the University of Waterloo in CG. Right. I have a question to the chairman of Morgan Stanley and Barclays. Do you believe that the regulatory requirements today are competing across jurisdictions in effect to fortify capital inside? Um, if so, what would you propose to uh, ameliorate that? And also, what is your thoughts on uh, regulating insurance markets? Um, well, clearly I do believe there is um, a conflict across jurisdictions, and it's because everybody is trying to ensure that their own regime, their economy is not susceptible to taxpayers bailing out banks, which is the whole basis behind resolution recovery. The problem is I don't believe there is enough uh, give in terms of recognizing the role of the host regulator versus the overriding regulator and working together on that. So I think many, much of this will be solved when you have resolution recovery, but in the meantime there is a significant risk of things like double leverage increased liquidity levels being held at national level and so on, which will actually constrict bank lending. I, I, think right. I agree with that. Uh, I mentioned in, 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 the, uh, in the case of Barclays, uh, if I take something like leverage, uh, the, the accounting definitions are very important here. Uh, we, we are said to be highly leveraged compared with American banks, but it depends on what accounting definition you use. Uh, by the end of this year, we'll have a leverage ratio of 3% under the UK rules. Under the American rules, we'd be on 6%, which mm -hmm. is in line with most, I think, with Morgan That's Stanley true. and most of the American banks. But I agree with uh, Colin Kelleher, the, the trapping of capital and liquidity which hopefully will come to an end when we've made progress on recovery and resolution on a cross-border basis with single or, or multiple points of entry, um, is in the meantime a real constraint on the capacity of banks to fulfill their intermediary role. So I think we're both flagging this as a real problem of which regulators who don't normally, uh, I think in most cases, have it in their um, set of objectives to be attentive to impact on the real economy as against financial stability, should actually be alerted to this. It's a, a very serious problem. Well, you know, the subject of uh, 
resolution of uh, large financial institutions uh, is perhaps one of the more uh, difficult ones that uh, regulators face today. So the question would be, uh, how uh, would you know, cross-border uh, cooperation facilitate the issue of resolution uh, of large financial institutions? Is this possible to begin with? Well, I mean, there is a, there is a, there is a real uh, complicating factor, which is that when you look at national entities that are part of a, national subsidiaries that are part of a global firm, part of their implicit value is that they are connected into a global network. So the idea that you can take Bank X subsidiary and country Y and just strip it out is, is difficult, and I agree with that because of the interconnectedness. On the other hand, what you're looking at in resolution is to make sure that you have legal and booking entities that can be easily segmented so you can reduce that complication. So, the, so there is an inherent friction between saving value but also uh, saving the taxpayer. And I think at the moment, quite rightly, the taxpayer is being protected first and we're assuming draconian situations. But yes, uh, we can get to a better place with a, with a harmonization. Now, within that, and I don't want to go on too much, we've only got to see the recent um, scrap over responsibility for derivatives regulation to understand that we have uh, regulators who can't quite work out where their role begins and ends without annoying others. So I think it's, it, is, it is very complicated. We've had, we've had the enormous benefits of a globalization of the world economy in the way everyone in this room knows about. Uh, it's been very tough for the regulators to keep up. And so what we're talking about in recovery and resolution is globalizing the regulatory framework. And I don't belittle in any way the complexity of that, but until we've done it, this will be a material break on the world economy. Thank you. Another question? Yes. Uh, thank you. I, I just uh, uh, came from a conference in uh, Miami, uh, and it was on a subject which may lead me to be th thrown out from here, uh, the shadow banking system, asset-backed securities. Um, the question has to do with regulation. We talked earlier this morning about unconventional monetary policy, which is partly because the banking system that existed before the crisis, which was obviously uh, over exuberant, is the shadow banking system is essentially flat on its back. Therefore, there isn't liquidity and the 5% retention rules that people have talked about cross jurisdictions are gumming up part of the system. For instance, in the US, student loans guaranteed 97% have to have 5% retention, which is in excess of the 3% actual risk. So my question to you is, what are you doing to help regulators see that they are solving real problems in regulation, not fiction? Well, I, I, I'm going to take a stab first very quickly. First of all, it's not just the regulators. When you look at the securitization rules, it's as much the accountants and the taxation people as well, which has allowed us to be boxed into a corner. The idea that the perceived wisdom post-2008 was that all securitization was bad is clearly wrong. Um, good securitization is an effective portfolio diversification of risk, very good for investors, very good for issuers, and at its most basic level helps the consumer significantly in reducing cost. So what happened was the base of this labeling that all securitization was bad, we had these bold rules without thinking through the consequences. But the problem was these then got compounded by competing accounting um, frameworks and uh, taxation as well. So we are helping uh, Morgan Stanley certainly, and I know Barclays are given a lot of input into how we can improve the securitization framework in Europe. David mentioned some very specific examples of where we can help. And it is critical that we get it right, given the amount of GDP, for instance, that is driven by the SMEs in Europe. A consequence of the effective closure of securitization activity is that long-term institutions like insurance companies and pension funds have been forced to look at other, other places to put money and the, the shadow financial sector 
has been a magnet for them, which is why you find their readiness to commit to hedge funds and indeed private equity uh, and so on. I think it's really important to get that, and we need uh, some easement in the solvency to insurance regulation space to match uh, easement in Basel III. Really important to get that institutional money back into conventional lending through uh, transparent processes in a revived securitization market. <clears throat> Thank you. <clears throat> Please. I want to direct this uh, question mostly to our chair on a, on, a, on a topic we really didn't cover, uh, sovereign bankruptcy uh, rules. Uh, you lived through uh, several emerging market crises, and if I remember, you were finance minister or central bank governor when Mexico pioneered the use of collective action clauses in uh, bond contracts. Now we have not only the holdout saga in Argentina, but also uh, Europe's uh, precedent uh, with the Greek experience. And there are a lot of calls now uh, among policymakers as well as practitioners for revisiting the, the sovereign bankruptcy rules after uh, the past decades uh, rejection of a mechanism maybe at the IMF for overseeing it. Uh, what do you see in terms of uh, reform in the near term? And do you think it is a, a more urgent issue right now? Well, I'm, I'm, I'm supposed to be the timekeeper here. <laughs> and, and frankly, uh, you know, when uh, those ideas were first put forth by the fund uh, about 10 years ago, uh, there were, uh, you know, questioned very widely, and they were widely opposed uh, by the financial community, including uh, many emerging markets. Uh, I think that uh, you know collective action clauses have actually worked quite well, and uh, you know the the number of uh, sort of orderly restructurings that have taken place over the past decade not not huge ones. There, I mean, obviously the uh, the, the most important uh, piece of news is the Argentinian default and so on and so forth. But there have been, been a number uh, of very successful uh, restructuring, including Uruguay and other countries, that uh, have proven that this route is the correct one. Uh, so that is the uh, extent of my, of my comment. Uh, but I had, I had, I had a, a, a question uh, uh, for, uh, for the governor. I was recently in your, uh, in your part of the world, and there were two issues that were uh, very prominently discussed in the meeting that I attended. You know, one of them was the question of unemployment, originally. Because more than unemployment, the question uh, of uh, the need to provide jobs for the enormous amount of young people that uh, come out of universities today and those that did not attend universities. I mean, this, this is, seems to be a looming problem in the region. The other one, of course, related to financial matters, is the development of capital markets in the region, and particularly the development uh, of local currency markets, which are practically non-existent in the region. So what would you say to that uh, government? I'll add another, a third one, which is the oil also. So, uh, well, I, I agree with you. These uh, first two, unemployment and uh, lack of development in the capital market, are definitely challenges. There are challenges to our region as well as many other developing regions. But uh, 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 the current uh, situation, the political and uh, security, uh, is uh, for country, uh, Arab countries in transition is also not helping. Uh, as far as the Gulf countries concerned, I think we have been able to uh, work on this problem uh, much more effectively than others. As a matter of fact, we are net uh, importer of uh, uh, workers and, and employees uh, in Saudi Arabia. For example, uh, uh, we have unemployment, but it is uh, a structural unemployment and not economic or cyclical uh, unemployment where we have uh, many expatriates occupying the majority of the jobs in the private sector. 
therefore, uh, the government has uh, started a very, very strong and effective program to uh, uh, replace some of those jobs uh, uh, that are occupied by expatriates by Saudi nationals through training on the job and better education and better incentives to the employers. Uh, the other aspect is, yes, uh, unfortunately we don't have uh, the depth and breadth of capital markets, whether uh, equity or debt uh, in, the, in the region. Uh, however, Saudi Arabia does have one of the largest uh, capital markets in the world. We have both equity as well as uh, debt market. Uh, I happen to be the chairman of uh, the Saudi Stock Exchange and it is very well developed and uh, we have an independent capital market. Well, Saudi Arabia counts for about one half of the total capitalization yes. uh, in the region. Indeed, mm -hmm. indeed it comes about 50% uh, of the capital market. But the third uh, uh, issue that's also associated with our region is oil. And uh, as you know, the region have uh, and Saudi Arabia specifically have always operated as uh, a stabilizer for the oil energy uh, in the world. And uh, we have uh, developed an access uh, capacity of two and a half uh, million barrels a day uh, to use it during uh, um, increased demand or speculation or geopolitical situation to make sure that prices are in the range that are suitable for both uh, producers and consumers. And if you notice, uh, over the last uh, 12 months or so, oil uh, prices have been more stable than any other periods you have seen before. Thank you very much. I think we have time for one more question. issue of uh, resolution regimes and, and what's happening. Uh, Can you speak louder, please? Uh, I'm sorry. Uh, my question is about resolution regimes and, and the issues we're facing. Um, do you see the future including branch networks, or is it pure subsidiarization as, as a protector of liquidity and the issue of capital? I think the the, the, the trend, certainly in Europe, has been within the European Union to have branches treated equally, uh, but we had uh, access for branches anywhere else in the European Union. The, the balkanization process that's now going on is seeing countries, including countries, for example, in Africa, in, in the emerging world, insisting on subsidiarization. I have to say, taking a leaf out of the uh, example that's been given by developed countries like uh, the United States. And I think that's unfortunate. As Colin Keller indicated, we've developed a global financial system uh, among banks with relationships among banks for which the legal organization is secondary to the fact that there is a group which runs and has responsibility for the whole of the operations globally. That's now being, I think the right word is fractured. And the question is how we can put this Humpty Dumpty back together again. And that's the challenge of recovery and resolution. Well, <clears throat> thank you very much. Let me bring this session to a close and thank very much the participants. Thank you, thank you very much. Um, okay, um, let's get started where the last panel of the day is a panel on the impact of financial reform on the real economy. Uh, we're a very distinguished panel. Uh, I'll be very be brief with introductions. Uh, all of you are very well known. <clears throat> to my left is Mohamed El Arian, who is CEO and co-CIO of PIMCO. Uh, next in the middle is Stefan Ingves who is the governor of the Swedish National Bank and also chair of the Basel Committee on Banking Supervision. And to my far left is uh, Brian Moynan, who is the CEO of Bank of America. Um, so I'm going to start with uh, some questions for all of you. And uh, since the IMF has just uh, published yesterday their new Global Financial Stability Report talking about uh, 
the main sources of probably new or old global systemic risk. I wanted to ask uh, each one of you uh, which are the systemic risks that have been mitigated since 2008, uh, which are the ones that are remaining open, and what are the new risks that are emerging in the global economy. So that's the general question, but I would like to then specifically for each one of you ask something uh, that comes out from the IMF report. And maybe I'll start with you, Mohammed. Uh, you can talk about generally this risk, but specifically the IMF report talks about the fact that the rise in U.S. interest rates might have on the bond market. You know, there was a headline this morning on the Financial Times saying IMF fears 2.3 trillion bond losses deriving from another 100 basis point increase in long-term interest rates in the United States. Uh, you are CEO of PIMCO, the large bond fund. Uh, how you manage such risk? Should you worry about them? And sh uh, should the Fed maybe uh, exit more slowly in order to avoid the bond market drought? And is there a moral hazard here? Maybe a Bernanke, Yellen put now in the bond market rather than the equity market, coming from concerns about systemic effects of rising bond yields on what's going to happen to bond funds, given the size of them. Uh, so how do you worry about these issues? Okay, so I, I tried to write most of your questions down, <laughs> um, but I ran, I ran out of paper. Um, okay, so, so first and foremost, I think we are in a much better position than we were in 2008. Um, you know, right now, we will slowly have to come out of a period of financial repression, a period where central banks, for good reasons, placed interest rates artificially low. The good news when you place interest rates artificially low is you allow an over-levered economy to heal slowly. The bad news is you enable all sorts of behaviors that could come back and haunt you. One of them is people believing that negative real interest rates are here forever. Okay, uh, maybe Stefan, uh, I would like you also to comment on what you see as the major systemic risk, but specifically I want you to focus on one of them. Um, throughout the economy, you have near zero policy rates, you have quantitative easing, you have credit easing, you have forward guidance, because the recovery is anemic subpar below trend, and you have to keep interest rates low for long enough to have an economic recovery. But then on the other side, people worry that uh, zero policy rates and QEs and forward guidance is gonna lead to financial instability, fraudiness in credit market, in property, eventually leading to bubble. Now, some people believe that they, you have two objectives, economic stability, financial stability, and you have two instruments, interest rates for economic stability and macro prudential regulation supervision for financial stability. But there are people like, for example, Jeremy Stein at the Fed who doesn't believe that macro pru is gonna work. And in the meanwhile, you have, uh, for example, fraudiness in property market in Sweden, in Norway, in Switzerland, in Hong Kong, in Singapore, in China. And so far, I would say policymakers have used the macro pru as a way of dealing with this financial fraudiness as opposed to traditional monetary policy. Uh, do you think that macro pru is going to work? And if it doesn't work, what do you do? If you have only one instrument and you have two goals that go in the opposite direction? Well, it maybe, it maybe <clears throat> works, but only, only up to a point, because macro prudential is just another way of raising the interest rate. Mm -hmm. Because each and every macro prudential measure has a shadow rate of interest. And what that essentially means that there has to be a reasonable connection, in my view, between whatever monetary policy means in, in, in a country and the macro prudential measures that you put in place. Because if that is not the case, then over time you will, take, you will create all sorts of uh, arbitrage opportunities and you're going to have to go and chase the financial sector and in introduce more and more and more of it. So essentially you need to do a bit of both. Uh, but, but if they're too far apart, then over time, not in the short run, uh, you will create all sorts of other distortions in the system, and that will be a problem in itself. Mm -hmm. So over time, what you can do is to just watch, watch what, what is going on. Now, presently, the issue has not so much over the past four or five years been one of bubbles. It has been, the issue has actually been the other way around, dealing with bubbles that have burst. So, but looking forward, of course, uh, in, into the future, one needs to watch that constantly. And my own country is one, 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 one good example where that's an issue because of the mortgage market. 
And what's your experience, uh, say, in the case of Sweden, in terms of whether MacroPro is going to work or not? It's too, it's too early to tell because we're behind schedule when it comes to putting in place the measures that are needed. And uh, I mean, but, but bottom line is, is, is very basic and simple. Somebody's got to say no, and it's unpleasant to say no, so it takes time to make that happen. And, and uh, in the meantime, uh, things just go up, up, up. And whether it will work or not, uh, time will tell. And in some instances, it will actually be more difficult to use macroprudential measures than monetary policy, because monetary policy sort of rains down over everybody in a, in a vague way. But uh, macroprudential measures are very pointed, and that means that uh, those who have to put up with those measures will complain. And, and they're easy to find. And that means that uh, uh, we run the risk of having elements of indecision bias in these systems, but it's just way too early to tell. OK. Um, Brian, I would like also to ask you about uh, systemic risk. And uh, during the global financial crisis, in specific, as we know, there was an issue of uh, too big to fail financial institutions. And some critics say that banks have become even bigger to fail because there has been uh, major consolidation. JP Morgan took over Bear Stearns and Washington Mutual, you folks took over countrywide and Mary Lynch. So the too big to fail problem has become bigger. And some recent scandals like JP Morgan suggest that maybe these financial supermarkets are becoming even too big or too complex to manage, even if you have a brilliant CEO like yourself or Jimmy Diamond, right? So, so, and in terms of solution of the too big to fail problem, people say, yeah, we're talking about living wheels, about cross-border resolution, about buffers of capital for CFIs, about, uh, you know, believable capital and so on. But all these things at the end of the day are not going to work and we have to go beyond, maybe go back to uh, Glass-Steagall or separating investment banking from commercial banking. Uh, what are your views on, on these sets of issues? Well, I, I always start for what are we here for, that's to serve our customers. And if you go to our customers, you know, they, they tell us they need these services combined. Um, in other words, they, uh, Mohammed's company needs to, as an investor customer, our, needs to, for us to provide liquidity for him and his colleagues that manage money and treasury securities, whatever it is. He is a, uh, an operating company, needs cash management services and lines of credit as an operating company, not the investment manager side, and, and likewise through the system. So the, the combination of these services are, frankly, is a United States phenomenon that they weren't combined in most of the countries they were because the, con the con customers need them. But when you think about it more broadly, I think you, you still are seeing, think about what, what has happened since 08. Basically, an institution like ourselves is about down about 30% in size and higher than an implied size. If you took the implied size of the institutions as they exist in 2007 and looked at this now, we're about $2.1.5 trillion in assets, and at the time, we'd have been about 3.1. They were already downsizing out of the crisis. The highest we ever were was probably 2.8. The capital's doubled. The is up four times. That has the impact that Mohammed was talking about, which is all that's about leverage, which slows down the amount of, especially in the markets-based activity, the amount of capital available because lever less leverage, less capital. When you go to the core real economy, in the United States especially, the money's there. I mean, and I would, I would disagree a little bit. We are seeing record small business originations, credit card balances are starting to grow. It's just that the customers underneath that are being fairly conservative. So a business client with 50 million under revenues, of which we have literally millions of, are drawing our lines of credit a 1,000 basis points less than they typically drew over time. Why? Because they don't have opportunity to put the money to work. So I think the real systemic issue still left is how do we create a growth enough growth in, in economies of the world that we can actually start lifting all the boats up a little bit. And, and I think we've delivered the banking system. We have work to do. There's all work to do. I think we've built the resolution plans, which I think Governor Tula talked about earlier, which we've submitted and spent hundreds of millions of dollars to get ready. Uh, we've taken the capital up. We've taken the liquidity up. But the reality is this, there's still a basic problem, which is the growth rates are not strong enough for people to, to absorb the unemployment. And, that's the fundamental issue. It's not about financial services, I think, as much anymore. There's all risk and a lot of work to do. It's more about how do we get the real economy to grow. And that is, that is, is, is a phenomenon which all the governments around the world are struggling as far as we see. Um, but do you believe that too big to fail problem has been resolved or what has been proposed? Uh, do you think that the too big to fail problem has been resolved? I, I or, it, or that the solutions that have been proposed are going to be effective in case there is another systemic financial crisis? I, I think that if you look at the, the amount of capital and liquidity, you look at the stress test. So what, what's our best indicia of, of the condition? And I think the stress tests were one of the, one of the best things that came out in terms of showing in the public domain 
a forward view of what the capital would be in the circumstances are worse than 2008. And if you look at the stress test results, and you look at what the Fed said around the last release, not what we'd say, but what the Fed said, they basically made two types of statements. One, here's the numbers, but secondly, the principle that says the large institutions should be able to stand the stress and still continue to participate in the economy, you're seeing them at that level now. Okay. And that, that's the key. The key is the second part, actually, is that we didn't have to all save ourselves by withdrawing from the markets. And I think right now you build capital up to the point where that happens. And I think, it's, I think that makes the likelihood you know, next to nothing. Mohamed, mm -hmm. uh, I want to go back to this issue that was uh, pointed out by the IMF report. Their data suggests that since 2009, inflows into fixed income funds uh, have increased relative to historical average by something like five trillion. It's a huge number. And their estimate suggests that if there was a significant increase in long-term interests in the United States, the losses could be extremely large, a number of over two trillion. Um, maybe the Fed is going to exit uh, tapering slowly. Maybe they're going to exit zero policy rate slowly. But we already seen just talking about tapering led uh, 10-year treasure going from 1.6 to close to 3% before that deciding not to taper led to a reduction. And uh, more of it is going to happen. So, so how do we deal with the fact that eventually exit is going to be from this thing, long-term interest rates will have to go to something closer to 4, 4.5%. And depending on how fast that happens, systemic effects will occur or should they occur? So, so like you say, like you say um, in, a, in the last few years, there's been a tremendous inflow into fixed income. Yeah. Some of the money was pulled in by people realizing that as they get older, they need a more stable or at least less risky form of holdings and they need income. Some of it was pushed out from the equity market by the trauma of 2008 and the unwillingness of people to expose them, themselves to that volatility. So the money that was pulled in is relatively more secure than the money that was pushed in. It's a little bit like, would you rather be pulled into a marriage or pushed into a marriage? <laughs> right. um, so as interest rates go up, what we have seen is money come out because people have suddenly realized, especially if they're taking a lot of duration in fixed income, that you can lose money in fixed income. So you are seeing somewhat of reality. What we haven't seen, what everybody's waiting for, is what's called the rate, great rotation. So, which is the reversal of the flows we've seen before. That's not happening, first of all, because at least for the front end of the curve, the Fed, through its forward guidance policy, has made it very clear that interest rates up to five years, up to seven years, are going to be pretty strongly anchored, and anchored for good reason. So the tapering is much more a long end of the yield curve story than it is a shorter end of the yield story. That's the first thing. Second, people are nervous about valuations elsewhere because what is the Fed trying to do? Well, the Fed is trying to promote growth. But can the Fed directly impact growth? No. It can try to change the behavior that impacts growth. So what do you do? You operate through the financial markets. You push people to take more risk. You push up valuations. People feel happier, the wealth effect. They're more optimistic, animal spirits. And you hope that that pulls up the fundamentals. So when people look at valuations, they realize that there is a wedge. And if you're going to invest at this level, you've got to be pretty sure that the fundamentals, what Brian was talking about, are going to improve to validate this. There wasn't enough confidence in the system as yet. So we, we haven't seen the great rotation as yet. What does it mean? It would probably be one of the most telescoped change if it occurs, right? So, so most people are managing interest rate risk and you can talk to Brian, you can talk to us. You know, it, it's not as if this issue hasn't been talked over and over. In fact, the big surprise is why hasn't it happened as yet, and, and, and I suggest that it's because it's not as obvious as people would, would think. Okay. Uh, Stefan, um, the topic of this panel is about uh, the impact of financial reform on the real economy. And if you look at the data, it seems like there is a bit of a gap between Wall Street and Main Street. In spite of quantitative easing, forward guidance, and other unconventional monetary policies, the recovery in most advanced economies has been anemic, subpar, below trend. Uh, even now, 
I mean, steady financial market, there's been a massive rally, say global equity markets have been rising, say 100% relative to the bottom of March of 09. So um, do we need uh, more monetary easing? Do we need more unconventional policies? Because that's the only game in town, given that there are constraints in terms of fiscal policy, uh, given that, of course, uh, actually the policy is a zero-sum game. Or does this uh, monetary easing unconventionally is just to liquidate going in the financial system and feeding frothiness and financial bubbles, creating moral hazard the way uh, people at the luncheon panel were discussing uh, at the global level? And what can we do for Main Street that is not just for Wall Street? For no, but monetary it? policy is, is, is part of it. As we just heard, the name of the game is to change the relative price between different types of assets, and, and, and that's, that's essentially why you why you do these things, but if, if you start looking at individual countries, then almost always it's not just enough to do just one thing, monetary policy. Normally when you have to go through periods of adjustments, you have to do all sorts of structural change that, that you have to deal with one, one way or the other, and that's painful, it takes time. Usually you have things to do on the fiscal side, but in addition to that, the perennial issue is uh, labor market issues and things like things like that and uh, that particularly holds in in uh, small open economies because if you don't change well then that will over time lower your standard of living uh, so you don't have much of a choice but you just have to do over time what you have to do uh, that's difficult uh, but eventually it will it will happen but i think it's important to stress that it's just to oversimplify to say that monetary policy and monetary policy only can always save you yeah, the, the real world is more complicated than that. Mm -hmm. uh, Brian, uh, there was a speaker this morning, uh, Dan Tarullo, who spoke about uh, the risk deriving from short-term wholesale funding, uh, both in the banking system and overall in the financial system. And also the IMF has pointed out in one of its chapters in the Global Stability Report about uh, the risks that are coming from short-term wholesale funding and how much uh, in a situation which the yield curve may be steepening again, there may be incentive to go uh, in that direction. And people also point out the, to the emergence of risky instruments like mortgage rates that are like season conduits, borrowing uh, short term overnight, highly leverage, investing into stuff that is very liquid. And more broadly, there is a concern about the fact that with zero policy rates, you have a whole range of uh, carry trades where you borrow overnight and invest, whether it's EM or commodities or equities or credit or whatever. So the whole set of issues regarding security financing transaction using the repo markets. Uh, some people like, for example, Jeremy Stein or Dan Tarul have talked about uh, solutions regarding having uh, uh, more liquidity, more capital, even things like uh, haircuts on repos or universal margin requirements as a way of dealing with these uh, risky maturity transformation and leverage. Uh, what are your views about uh, how much one should be concerned about this phenomenon and what should be done about it? Yeah, I think <coughs> I would divorce the interest rate environment from that question. The question, I think, if you look at what happened around the, uh, around the financial crisis around the world was the confidence was lost and then the liquidity run started. And, and, and the shorter the liquidity, uh, you know, the faster it ran. And I think in the industry, there has been a massive move away from things they call non-traditional repo and things like that, and more of the stuff that has moved to duration and, and matching the durations. Also, the, the exchange traded derivatives and all this makes us all easier. But I think Governor Trillo's uh, uh, discussions with us in the industry has been this issue needs to be fixed because the, if you think about a standalone broker-dealer circa 2007, when they got pushed, there was no stability of the funding model at the level they'd like. Today, our, our balance sheet, our securities firm, is about less than a third of our balance sheet, and it's only about 25 or 30 percent of our capital. And so there's a there's $100 billion of capital and a, a $2 trillion, a trillion and a half dollar balance sheet that sits outside that sort of makes its money a different way, and that provides a stability. And, and, and so the question is what you don't want is, is standalone people relying on market funding that will dry up on, on perceptions of confidence. But I don't think that's interest rate driven, honestly. I mean, we balance our balance sheet pretty tightly. I don't, it's really more just straight market access, market availability at any price. And, and then, you know, when the confidence goes, what's left? And then, and I think that's what they're after. And I, I think it's the right inquiry. And I think we've gotten to, it's one of the pieces that uh, Governor Trill has been clear about is still, he's still trying to <coughs> figure out the ultimate right answer to, along with his colleagues around the world. Um, uh, Mohammed, um, 
a question about the emerging market risk. You know, you've been not just king of the bond market, but king of the EM bond market for a long time. Um, there have been significant pressure on a number of emerging market economies, especially those that have current account deficit, fiscal deficits, falling growth, rising inflation, political and electoral uncertainty. And fair enough, compared to the past, maybe you could argue risks are lower because they're flexible exchange rates, less uh, liability dollarization and currency mismatches, war chest of reserves, stronger financial system, uh, less uh, balance sheet problems that lead to solvency risk. But in spite of that, you know, uh, there are policy dilemmas. If you tighten monetary policy, you kill growth, and if you, instead you use monetary policy, you have a risk of an inflationary collapse of currencies and who's going to fund your current account. Uh, it's true that you have shifted the currency risk from the debtor to the creditor, but now the creditor has to take both the currency risk, the market risk, and the credit risk. So effectively, what's the risk they're pulling out of these markets because they don't want to bear that currency risk? And for the last few years, there has been such an overweight into emerging market, both foreign currency and local debt by dedicated and cross crossover investors that even small shifts of portfolios from overweight to market weight, let alone to underweight, could lead to sharper price corrections in markets that are not as liquid and deep as advanced economies. So, uh, so what are the risks that something systemic happens in some of these emerging markets? You know, it, it's amazing to me, and seeing, seeing Guillermo here, and all this, amazing to me how volatile the, the, the narrative about the emerging markets has been. So, in 2008, when the crisis occurred, everybody assumed that the emerging markets would be really badly hit. Um, they came out much better than, 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 the develop, than the advanced countries. The narrative then shifted to the decoupling, that this is, this is the part to be, strong balance sheets, etc. And lots and lots of people invested on that hypothesis. Then comes a shock, which is in, on May 22nd when, when the Fed indicated it would taper. And then you've got capital going back out. And suddenly the narrative has changed tremendously. And I know, you know you, you've contributed a view saying that you know, emerging markets is back to the old days. It's not. Okay, so, so a few facts. First, no matter where you are, it is very difficult to navigate this global economy when the West is doing what it's doing. Okay? When you have the supplier of the global reserve currency, the deepest, most predictive financial markets, being subjected to the sorts of political issues that they are subjected today, you will import that instability. That's just a fact of life. Right. So the first thing is, it's not easy being an emerging market in a system that is a, on, based on concentric circles, and the assumption is that the politician will take eco economic governance at the center in a consistent and coherent fashion, and they don't. Okay. Secondly, it is very difficult being an emerging market when you attract a ton of tourist dollars. We always, whenever we invest in a country, we always ask the question, or in an asset class, this is also true for inflation-protected bonds in the US, how big is the dedicated investor base? The dedicated investor base is stable. The crossover investor base comes in and out. They are like tourists, right? Think of a tourist, it gets all excited, we're gonna to go to emerging markets, the pamphlet looks great, the beach looks wonderful, huge excitement, we all go as tourists, and then we hear about a riot waking out somewhere, we immediately go to the airport. Right? And what happens with crossover money is exactly this. The money comes in in a big way, especially when it's being pushed out of the West by artificially low interest rate. It overwhelms the system on the way in, and then you have really difficult choices to make. Do you let your currency appreciate too much? Do you let credit expand too much? What do you do? And then suddenly, it goes out again. And sometimes it goes out with nothing to do with you. So the reality is that the volatility of the narrative on emerging markets is well beyond the reality. The reality is, as a group, they are much stronger today than they've been in the past. There are some notable exceptions, and you've cited what constitutes a, not a notable exception. It's the good old combination of twin deficits, low reserves, reliance on short-term debt, and there's quite a few that have that. But I don't see them constituting 
a, a source of systemic risk as a whole. For us, as longer term investors, okay, the volatility is great because when, when people go out too much, you want to step in. And when suddenly the asset class becomes the flavor of the month, well, they can have your assets at that point. Uh, fair enough. I mean, tourists might be fickle, but take a dedicator, uh, a kind of fund that invests in local currency, that of YAM, and suddenly you had massive losses because the currencies are falling, credit risks are widening, interest rates are going higher, and you have massive losses. And uh, liquidity actually in this market in the last few years has not really improved, and therefore the price adjustment, whether it shifts out, becomes even bigger. Um, how do you how do you react? And isn't there so, so all, all, many all, of these investors might sure. decide at some point to just uh, exit as well? All, all this is a question <laughs> of price, right? So, so what you've said is that investors have to price properly liquidity risk, and I agree. Yeah. One, one implications of what's happening on the regulatory side is there's less liquidity in the system, right? And that's just a fact, and people should price that much better. Okay, they they get to do that. Secondly. Okay, you've got to take a view on credit risk. In some countries, credit risk is quite high. In other countries like Mexico, credit risk is actually very low. Thirdly, you've got to take a view on policy risk. How consistent is the policy? And you've got to compare this to the price. So a lot depends, you know, early in the year, these things were mispriced. Today, I can tell you they're a little bit more attractively priced. Okay, um, maybe before we and uh, move on to the q and I would like to ask actually a final question to all of you, uh, the same question. Uh, last month was the fifth anniversary of the collapse of Lehman Brothers that led to the peak of the global financial crisis. So there have been a whole bunch of post-mortems and discussion on whether the financial reforms that have been implemented or are being implemented are making the financial system uh, more stable. Uh, there are some people who are skeptical. I saw a couple of op-eds recently, one by Lord Adai Turner titled The Failure of Free Market Finance, an academic like Anand Admati saying five years of financial non-reform. And the point that, for example, she makes is that Basel III implies that banks are still allowed to fund 97% of their assets with debt and leverage. There is too much leverage and too little capital in the system and too little liquidity. And she also says little has changed in the politics of banking. Um, what are your views, starting maybe with Brian, Stefan, and I think, I think Mohammed? <laughs> um, I, I think that anybody who looks at the capital levels of institutions, the, the size has come down, the capital is up, the liquidity is up, the amount of inquiry around that, the stress testing process, the resolution, it, it is a lot, a lot safer, there's not a question. The question then is what do, what do we keep doing next to make sure that it never happens again, and that's, that's what we keep working on. But, I think there's a lot of, you know, everybody has a favorite, has a favorite rule they don't, they want to measure something on. But if you go back to a truism in the United States, it is I, I haven't found, and I've, I've challenged people to challenge me on it, but I have not found an institution ever fail with more than six percent tangible common equity ratio in the United States. In the, the whole industry, that's is above that by a lot. Now. We're at seven in you know, most institutions. So you build, you know, real equity measured by gap assets without any kind of risk weighting, then you have the leverage rules. So I think it is a lot safer um, and the way we're approaching the business um, is a lot, has a lot of the rules. The rules are not all done yet and we still have things like the local rule to finally implement in the United States and the faster we get those in I think we'll build up people's confidence in the system that, that the work is done to, to on an item by item basis to have stopped this from happening again and so we need to get those in. But the body that is in is a tremendous difference and I think that that it took a lot of work, and and and, uh, and also, as uh, Mohammed said, is is it changes the nature of our role to provide a lot less leverage into the systems generally, and and that has an impact on the real economy. But that's one that was decided to be taken, and, and I think it's right. We can't have the opposite, which is you have the, the volatility. Run. So I think it's safer. I think it's clear. I think the rules are there. I think we still have work to do, but it's, it all has an impact on the amount of leverage and, and capital available in the system, which is a policy decision that has to be made. Yeah, Stefan, as you answer this question, I wanted maybe also a specific reference. 
as the IMF has done its report about the situation in the Eurozone where the IMF argues banks have not been yet fully recapitalized. There is a high concentration of leverage in some parts of the corporate system from Spain, Italy, Portugal, and that is a potential problem for the banking system in terms of NPL. So how do you see the situation overall and then specifically in the case of the Eurozone? Well, the first question then, whether we are better off today compared to, let's say, five, six years ago, and my answer is yes, we are better off. But at the same time, uh, we always need to remind ourselves that uh, uh, we have a tendency, and history tells us that, to create too much leverage from time to time. And no one is uh, immune to that. So one has to stay vigilant, and when these things start bubbling up again, one has to make sure that it doesn't go, go overboard. And unfortunately, if you take a 100-year perspective or something like that, then we, we don't have too good a record, uh, because it seems to be that each generation has to learn, and each generation forgets. So, so uh, we have to be vigilant, but for sure we're better off in, in, in a short time perspective, we're much, much better off today compared to what we were five, six years ago. Then the whole issue of, uh, of Europe and coming from a part of Europe where we don't have problems in the banking sector. Uh, and now this has by now been going on for, uh, for a long time in Europe. I think it would make a lot of sense to actually go and get the lemons and make sure that it's publicly known where the lemons are. Put in the capital, set up bad banks, and get on with it. Mm -hmm. And from that perspective, what is called the asset quality review and all the elements that go with that makes a lot of, makes a lot of sense. You're, somebody's going to have to probably put some real money into the system. That problem needs to be solved. Yeah, but if you don't solve it, you're really talking about the empty set in some sense. And that will hurt everybody and the whole thing is just stretched out, out over time. So doing a serious asset quality review and deal with the banks that are in trouble in a forceful way, uh, that's the way to do it. Mm -hmm. Well, let's say in the Eurozone, many people say there are way too many banks. I mean, maybe in the US there's been too much consolidation, but in the Eurozone not enough. Many of these banks are not very profitable. There is an element of disintermediation as major corporates now are relying on the capital markets and that shrinks further revenues and income for banks. So how do we achieve a significant consolidation in the banking system in the Eurozone over time, cross-border especially? Over time you just shrink the system and once you do a, an asset quality review, once you realize whether mm -hmm. a bank over time can produce a net positive cash flow or not, then that's when the day of reckoning comes and it doesn't really make any sense to maintain banks that don't make a profit. So that's when you have to shrink those parts, uh, parts of it. It is painful to do, uh, but still you'll be better off doing it now <coughs> compared to just uh, not doing it. Uh, Mohamed, uh, your view, we have too much uh, private debt, now we have also too much public debt, so by some measure leverage in the entire system, living inside the financial system has not fallen very much. Uh, are we better off or, or what? So we have reallocated the leverage from, from the private sector to the public sector. Yeah. Um, it makes it less unstable, but it doesn't solve the problem as a whole. I mean, I, there is no doubt U.S. banks are safer from a capital, asset quality and liquidity. Okay, No doubt whatsoever. Internal behaviors are changing. You mentioned them. They're changing, but they're changing more slowly. So that you've got to keep an eye on that. Regulators still have to do three things. Complete the specification of rules, right, so that people know under what rules they're operating. Much better job at international harmonization. There's still some, some, some major differences. Um, the supplementary leverage ratio is an, an example of that. And then make sure that the activities that are migrating, because there's lots of financial activities that are migrating, um, to exchanges, for example, are actually migrating to places that are safe. Right? I love exchanges. I think they are, they are more transparent. They allow netting, but it's really important to, to keep an eye on them. Um, for a global company, and I see a lot of colleagues here, it's going to be really tricky managing a global company against di different national jurisdictions that are approaching issues differently. Right? And this whole concept of how do you run a global company in this world is going to do that. I think the biggest tragedy, if you take a five-year look, 
is the following, and this really speaks to an e economic governance issue, is why is it that Wall Street triggers policy urgency and Main Street doesn't? So five years later, so Wall Street, you can actually look and, and see a remarkable improvement. Main Street, you're still stuck with a 12% unemployment rate in Europe. You're still stuck with a 7.3% unemployment here in the US, even though the participation rate is at 35% lows. Long-term unemployment, 40, 50%. Youth unemployment, 25%. And yet you don't get the urgency on the policy front that you do when Wall Street um, has an issue. And I think if you look back, that's the big question mark, is why is it five years later that we haven't had the same sort of urgency devoted both to Wall Street and Main Street? Okay. Uh, maybe a final question for you, Stefan, before we move to the Q&A. And again, you're, you're outside of the Eurozone, but <laughs> as the head of the Basel Committee, you have to think about these questions. Uh, in the Eurozone, people talk about this uh, doom loop between the sovereign and the bank, right? Banking risk became sovereign risk when banks had to be bailed out, but now sovereign risk is becoming banking risk because some fraction of the public debt is held by uh, the banking system. And the question is, uh, you know, what you do about it? Um, and I think there are two specific questions that are in that context important. One is, uh, in this asset quality review and stress test that the ECB is going to do, should you also stress uh, the sovereign and consider a situation in which there could be uh, having debt restructurings in, uh, in the periphery of the Eurozone? If you don't do it, uh, people are going to say it's not credible. If you do it, then you're admitting that there are states of the world where maybe a restructuring should occur. And secondly, there have been proposals like those of uh, Weidmann at the Bundesbank of uh, imposing different capital charges on a public debt depending on its riskiness. Uh, is it something that one should be thinking about doing over time or not? Well, the first issue when it comes to the asset quality review and how to do it and not to do it, that question should be put to the ECB, not to me. Uh, but one, one way of dealing with that particular issue is, is to ensure that the reporting is transparent so that you can understand what's on the asset side of various banks. Because there are market prices out there, and regardless of what, what price government paper happens to be booked, then people can make up their own minds. And that's a, that's a good thing all in itself, regardless of sort of all these, all, all these technicalities. So transparency, that will take care of the short run issue. Then we have a sort of a medium to long term issue thinking about uh, the riskiness of government debt uh, when mm -hmm. it comes to dealing with it from sort of a banking perspective. That can be handled and that can be done in many different ways, but it will take years to, uh, to, to get there and it really won't change anything in the, in the short run because we are, where we, are, we are where we are and it will take years to, to, to deal with the issues. But it certainly is an issue that, that needs to be thought uh, through. Uh, and also, which is not what people have talked about so much today, nowadays, but, but my own country is a good, good example. In the 80s, 50% of the assets of our banks were government bonds. And that's massive crowding out. So clearly, over, to, over, over time, when things normalize, it doesn't really make much sense to have banks that just hold government paper because somebody's actually, somebody has to lend uh, to the corporate sector in one uh, one way or the other, but I'm really, really talking about a a, a slow process and slow a slow movement here. Mm -hmm. I think Please, there's, a, there's a there's a there's a reality that outside the United States that the depth of the capital markets does not allow the 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 uh, debt of the sovereigns to be held outside. It's just the structure Correct. of the markets, sure. and we got to get there because, frankly, that transmission mechanism too, for what Muhammad does for a living, sure he has to market his portfolio, but then that just spread throughout the you know, pension funds and everybody as opposed to having caught inside the banking system. And I think that's a transformative thing for both emerging market health long term for you know, resiliency of systems is to, is to figure out how to create capital markets around the world that, that have the depth to them that the United States. And we should be careful when we look outside our country at how difficult that question is when you say a bank inside a country can't hold its own country's bonds. That's, that's, that's a tricky statement to try to administer through, and I think you know, we need to find an alternative for somebody else to hold them, and ultimately, if you're going to do that. And there's they're just not the depth of holders and the investment bases and mm -hmm. things like that. Or there's the tours that come in and grab them and give them back up, which creates volatility around it. And, and so I think that's, as an industry, that's something we owe 
the world is, is how, to, how to do a better job at creating that depth, which then provides a resiliency in times of stress to price access to market, move them at some price and things like that. Uh, but, but let, let me push you on, on this point because, I mean, the traditional argument, of course, has been that if most of the public debt is in the hands of the banks and then some sovereign stress occur, you have a risk of a banking crisis. And instead, if most of the debt is held by financial market, capital market, long-term investors, they, the, the losses and the risk are more distributed and they can be absorbed better and so on, fair enough. Uh, but the reality is that there is so much now of that, that outstanding. The average has gone from 70% of GDP to above 100 for the average advanced economy, including now United States and even other countries. And we don't know yet what's going to happen if there's going to be a sharp increase in long-term interest rates. That's why the IMF is concerned that you'll have losses of over $2 trillion if you have a, even only 100 basis point increase in U.S. interest rates. And you could say maybe those losses are going to be more diffuse if they are in uh, the investor base as opposed to the banks. But then uh, take the SNL crisis. You had you know, hundreds of small banks going bust, and it had a systemic effect. So if you're going to have losses of that amount, uh, could we get something that is systemic, even if it is in the... Uh, in the capital markets rather than the banking system. I don't know, uh, Mohamed, do you have any views or any one of you on this particular issue? No, I agree with you. Yeah, they I don't agree. create the structural yeah. risk. When they're in those forms, they don't create the structural risk that you have a dollar, you have a, a fixed amount of liability you have to pay off a floating rate asset base. You, you, the assets mark and liabilities mark together, and the, and the duration of the holders leave aside runs a concurrent of structures. A longer. So the SNL crisis was they, they had a mismatch alcohol position. If you look at the balance sheets of regional banks and banks, they're very short because, frankly, we've learned a lot from those crises, and maybe there'll be something we have to learn in the next crisis, but that we learned. So I think you've got to be careful about saying it's not a good thing. We would rather have not have the marks anywhere, but the reality is if they're on the most patient balance sheets, which is the citizens read of the country directly or indirectly through state pension funds, that's actually better because they can wait out and have the value recovered. Remember, this is a mark you know, of interest rates that goes through or a credit mark that ultimately, if they're paid, comes back out or it's an opportunity of lost earnings. It's not, you know, if you don't have to liquidate, it's, it's not there. And if it's in the hands of investors looking at long term and it's batched off against their retirement you know, income and stuff, that's a different place than to have it in a place that has to pay a dollar to a depositor or to someone else tomorrow morning. And that's, that's where I think Without that buffer, I think it just creates tremendous stress in the, what, the, what we call the banking system, you know, the technical balance sheets of banks. I, I mean, I, I, it's hard to solve. It's not easy, but it, it, it'll take time. Mohamed and Stefan, yeah, if both of you want to say something, yeah, please. No, I, I mean, to create a domestic bond market is like buying insurance. It never hurts, and it's something which is very, very good to have if you run into trouble. Uh, because that means that it's easier to place whatever debt you have domestically compared to having it abroad or having the tourists that we have talked about. Somehow, technically, it seems to be hard to do in many places. So it takes years and years to make it happen. But it really pays to do it. Mohamed? I'll just add, and just complimenting, the system can cope mostly with interest rate risk. What it cannot cope with is default risk. Right. Right? So if you, if, if you impose a default in your scenario, we would give you a completely different answer than if you're just saying it's, it's interest rate risk. And, and let me want one thing um, on, the, on the stress test. The power of the US stress test and why they were so important is because people like us could deconstruct them. And we could put in whatever assumption we wanted about the prices according to the balance sheet. So it didn't matter whether the assumption was, okay, as long as we were able to put our own assumptions and be confident okay, on that. And, and that's really important to understand that, that investors in the marketplace are not looking for a grade. Okay? They're not looking for A, B, C. Okay? They're looking for the ability to apply their own assumption right, to transparent data and therefore make their own conclusion. And that's a really important transition that the US was able to make in its stress test. And other parts of the world are still a little bit more hesitant in making it. But, and there's a, a, being able to compare across institutions as, as another window. So you have not only the market's ability to look, you have the Correct. regulatory framework, the regulatory fraternity's ability to look, but you also have the fact that you can look across institutions and say, you know, why does a institution think they're 
assets perform like such and be, and it gets to the credibility question. And so there's a great leveling to all this, that the, that the transparency is, is in, uh, in information. It doesn't mean they have to agree with your answer, but they have the ability to even check it, or they see 15 answers and say, why are these differences there? So I, I think out of everything that's come out, this is the one I think that will keep help to keep all things in moderation, honestly, uh, you know, over time, going to your point, which is running these forward, change capital from a spot and time measurement, do I have enough today? to a question, do I have enough over two years forward under the worst circumstances we can make up? And I have enough capital to continue to participate in the economy. You just think about that for a second. That's a completely different capital regime than, than the institutions of the world we're operating under, which was, do I have enough today as opposed to do I have enough to last two years? Keep paying dividends, honestly. Keep lending, and I still have enough. That's a major change. Now, do we have everybody there? It'll take time. It'll be improved. But that's a big change in the sort of thought process. Okay, very good. I think we have still 15 minutes for Q&A, and um, if anyone wants to ask a question, the gentleman there, <coughs> if you want also to give your name and your affiliation as well. Bob Berth, World Academy of Art and Science. Uh, I know the Redwoods Committee will have a session sometime on the, on the World Bank, but let me uh, preempt that a little bit by asking Mr. Ellerian uh, to talk about that a second, because you are an advisor now on international assistance, and I'm wondering, and, it's, and the World Bank is just going through a major reform that uh, is presumably aimed at uh, helping Main Street and many other countries. So what do you see uh, as the future now of uh, at the World Bank and the soundness of its reforms, or lack thereof, and uh, official assistance in helping Main Streets around the world? So, so two qualifiers. Um, first, I speak in, in my personal capacity. And second, I'm delighted to see that, that there's, the other, there's another member of the Global Development Council, Bill Riley, who's here, so he can correct me immediately since he's much more knowledgeable than I am. Um, you know, whether you're the, the World Bank, whether you're, you're the IMF, you have the reality that the world has changed very quickly. So the world of development has changed very quickly. Official aid now is tiny compared to private flows and compared to what developing countries themselves can mobilize. Right? Um, we've learned a lot more about development, about the importance of what drives development. The old style of go in there, offer some money, put conditionality, and you'll get things done, I think most people realize that's, that's completely outdated. Now it's much more about how do you augment how do you bring modern tools, how do you empower people. I mean, it's amazing what, 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 what the philanthropic sector and the private sector has done to development. And the reduction in poverty that has resulted has been huge. So these organizations, the World Bank, the IMF, and others, have got to evolve, okay? And it's not easy. First, you've got to evolve your mindset. Secondly, you've got to realize that your old tools are now very partial, and you need a whole set of new tools on that. Third, you've got to evolve your governance system, which is really hard. You know, once people are empowered in terms of voice and representation, they don't give it up very easily, right? And you can see the difficulty that, that both, both Bretton Woods institutions are having to have a governance system that reflects the world of today, that are, and not, not the world of yesterday. Now, none of what I've said Okay, is new. I've, people realize that. They're working very hard, but they're also dealing with national jurisdictions that have a huge suspicion about delegating power up um, to the multilateral level. I think at the end of the day, and this is, a, this is a word that has been overused, but I think it's really important, it's going to really matter. Partnerships are going to really matter. Right? And the IMF is going to have to learn to partner better we, we, the World Bank is going to have to learn to partner better. The private sector, we're going to have to learn, learn to partner better with civil society, right? And, and that is what's going to be required to continue this amazing progress that has already occurred. And you know, at the end of the day, and, and, and I look at this, and I know that this is a point that's very close to Bill, we have to realize that development is in our national interest, right? You know, diplomacy, development, all that contributes to our national security. Right? And by understanding how, how the development process has evolved, right, it's, it's a, it's a win-win because it's the right thing to do, but it's also not in our national interest. 
it's over there. Mazio Vinovi, Goldman Sachs. Uh, you've all asserted that, and mentioned the consequence, one consequence of the new post-global financial crisis regulatory thrust is less liquidity in the markets, especially the bond markets. Uh, do you think this is a phenomenon that's here with us to stay, or just like the drop in liquidity that we saw after the LTCM crisis in the bond markets, there'll be new actors that will come in over the next few years to fill in the gap here? <coughs> I, I, I'd say that the, the leverage is, the limitations of the rules are here to stay. So I, I, sometimes we use le leverage and liquidity inter inter interchangeably. So uh, what, I should, what I think I said, and maybe I didn't, but is the leverage is absolutely, you know, these are the rules. And, and there's, you know, we, we meet the rules, we're supposed to meet 19. There's still potential other changes, but the leverage, the leverage uh, you know, size of balance sheet, size of equity basis to support them, I think, is here. And then liquidity requirements for the LCR and other types of tests are, are set. And those are the, in the Basel and the regulators around the world have implemented their, their forms and are in the process of finishing that up. Um, you know, liquidity will come, there, there will be other providers, like in the, in, the, in the fact that repo markets are hard now for the core institutions to support. You're seeing other repo providers who have been there get up and supply, you know, effectively treasury type repo. There'll be people that the exchanges, as Mohammed said, will will see more you know, volumes because we're putting you know, derivatives on those. And I, so I think there'll be to say liquidity will never be the same, and is is probably impossible to talk about. But the idea that there'll be additional liquidity sources form absolutely, and you see you've seen them form so far, and you'll see them continue to form. And one of the worries about um, systemic risk is to make sure those people who form those liquidity pools you didn't push push it out of the environment where it can be watched and, and monitored into a, a different environment. And that's one of the challenges with, with the structures. Where, where is the P going to end up? And, uh, and what's the risk? It may be a different kind of risk. It may be an operational risk. It might be a cybersecurity risk. It may be a risk that's much different than the traditional risk of balance sheet risk as we think about it. But uh, I, you know, the leverage is here, and I, the rules are set. And we're all marching towards 2019 when they're fully impl implemented. And I think the, the LCR and stuff is part of it. Uh, Mohammed or Stefan? No, just to say to add to that, it would be remarkable if you change the rules and nothing happens. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that's the ba I mean, things are supposed to happen. And, and, uh, but that doesn't mean that certain types of transactions will disappear forever. They might be produced and, and, and supplied by, by others. So certainly there will be changes in the system. And we're going to go through a transition period until 1920, uh, roughly, and, and then uh, new, new phenom phenomena will, 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 will show up and, uh, and there will be new suppliers. Uh, but that no, absolutely nothing would change. That, that was never meant, it wasn't meant to be that way. Yeah. Mohamed? So let me assure you things are changing, and, and if anybody needed a reminder of that, it was in May, June, when just the mention of a word, taper, cause dramatic price movements and ask the question why and that is because when investors went to the broker dealers the broker dealers due to both ability and willingness weren't able to absorb the amount of paper that was looking for a new home and the result of that was very sharp price movements um, so so yes there is less liquidity today and there will be even less liquidity less liquidity than that when suddenly there's an unanticipated development. So there's three reactions to this. One is, 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 is what we talked about earlier, which is people like us are pricing liquidity risk differently. We are managing cash differently. We are managing leverage differently because we recognize that we have to be able to stay in the trade. First issue. Second issue that's, 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 that's changing is that new providers are going to come in. And you already see some, some people trying to fill that, fill that um, issue. And the third one is look for pipes to slowly, and Brian is not going to like to hear this, but look for pi pipes to slowly to be built around the broker dealers. Right? Now, that's not going to substitute for what's in the middle, right? but that's sort of a reaction um, that we expect. But there's no doubt in my mind that there is less liquidity during times of stress right now than there's been before. Right? And, and that's just one of the consequences of the changes. And the hope 
And I think the reality is this changes behavior elsewhere as well. Every, the precautionary element spreads through the system when people realize that the fire escape may not be as strong as it, you, you thought it was before. Oh, I think the electronification of the fixed income markets is, is going to be as relentless as it was in the equities markets. And, you know, in the model, we'll keep adjusting to where but I think the broker-dealer community will use this balance sheet where it's valued and the rest of the stuff will go through and that's, you know, we're leading, you know, we're all leading it and driving because that's the reality. You can't get paid enough for the more, you know, liquid stuff and the investors want to find pools of liquidity that are between themselves, for lack of a better term. And, and that, I don't, I don't think those are bad developments. Either. I think they're good developments, ultimately. As long as we're valued. Yeah. Okay. Um, the lady in the back. <clears throat> I'm Susanna Caffaro from the Group of Lecce. I would like to ask if moving from a world with a single uh, or one reserve currency to a situation with the increasing possibilities to diversify is going to reduce the risk coming from, from economics and from political situations. <coughs> So I think I heard the question, and correct me, okay, um, about a move away from one reserve currency reducing exposure to national political risk. Was that the question? Um, always remember, you cannot replace something with nothing. Okay? So there is no other currency right now that can take the role of the dollar. Right. And, and that's just a reality. There's no other financial system that is as deep, as sophisticated, and until recently as predictable <laughs> as the US. So to the extent that we shift away, away from a dollar-centric system, it's going to take quite a long time. What you will see, and there was another announcement today, is countries are going to start building small pipes, so you're going to see a lot more bilateral agreements, a lot more bilateral swap lines that try, try to reduce, but the system will continue to depend on the issuer of the global currency and there's only, reserve currency, and there's only going to be one real big reserve currency uh, for a while, and, and that's the U.S. It's just very difficult to replace. Noriel, your view? Uh, no, I, I do agree that for the time being there is no alternative to the US dollar. Uh, the euro has its own problems, uh, other reserve currencies are too small as a market and eventually maybe the RMB or other YAM currencies may play a role in the international monetary system, but you need the uh, exchange of flexibility, capital liberalization, domestic liquid market for RMB debt for that to happen. So over the next 20 years maybe yes, but in the short run we're still stuck with the US dollar. Unless we default next week and then <laughs> stuff could happen. <laughs> um, that was an uh, editorial comment. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Hi, I'm Sean Egan from Egan Jones Ratings Company. The underlying premise in dealing with the credit crisis of 2007-2008 was uh, that you could increase money supply uh, and yet uh, not trigger any problems because there's no place else to go. And that increased inflation would not happen because there is excess capacity both with labor and with capital. What if those premises are wrong over time and what are some triggers that we should watch for and perhaps it's a withdrawal, uh, it was it, uh, as a result of the tapering that indicates that perhaps you have some early problems. I, I mean, it's been five years, so, uh, is it five years in December they dropped it to 25 basis points? Yeah, yeah so I, I think, so you haven't seen it, sure, the inflationary pressure is not there, and that doesn't mean it's, yeah, but I, I think we haven't seen it, and it's been five years. It's a long, one of the longest durations that rates have ever been this nominally low on both the short end and the long end. If you go back and pull up on Bloomberg's screen, how many days is the Treasury uh, tenure traded under 3%? I mean, it's a very small. So this is a long duration. Um, but when you talk to our clients and customers, you don't see the kinds of uh, risk build up. There is going to be, a, and Mom had mentioned earlier, a mark-to-market question. But if you think about that 100 basis point rise that everybody keeps talking about, Think about it in terms of the mortgage loans, which actually moved 100 basis points. Uh, 
you have a hundred thousand dollar loan, that's a thousand dollars a year. On a two hundred thousand dollar loan, it's two thousand dollars a year. On a on a hundred thousand dollar loan, that's a Starbucks coffee a day. So it's not going to change that borrower's ability to want that house because they probably got to make about fifty thousand to sixty thousand dollars in the house building to qualify. So I don't, I don't, I don't see the move in rates, you know, changing something dramatically. It'll have an effect that lowering rates did, and it'll come back out. But I, 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 we haven't seen that the inflation and the issues surface yet, and we this is a completely different scenario than, you know, all the economists are better to answer this than I am, have been trained in, and they all say I don't, you know, it's, it's somewhat therefore, therefore somewhat unpredictable, but if you actually look at what we see in the real economy, you know, as rates moved up, you didn't, you saw refi volumes drop off, because that's a mathematical calculation, but purchase volume stayed relatively uh, set, set up. When you talk to our corporate customers, they don't have, there's not a lot of commodity inflation they're dealing with, there's not a lot of price inflation and wage, you know, a lot of wage pressure on them. There's the issue of them figuring out whether there's final demand for their products and the environments around on that, but there's not a lot of stuff they're worried about there. So they're not sitting there saying, I gotta go out and run out and buy equipment because I'm afraid to lose it, so I'm gonna push prices up on that. Um, most people can't get that much in terms of price with their customers. Um, we see it as a big you know, person spends money, we don't see it. So I, I, I don't, it hasn't shown up yet. Will it? I don't know. It's a, uh, yeah, I mean, if I could conclude actually by making a comment, the base money is double, triple, soon quadruple in U.S., but velocity has collapsed, and therefore uh, you have excess reserves rising, and therefore that money is not put at work. You have a uh, slacking capacity in goods market, in labor market, now in commodities. And if you look actually at inflation trends, uh, inflation is falling in the eurozone to 1.1 percent, might go below 1 percent, well below the 2% ECB target, inflation is falling in the United States, inflation is falling in Sweden, Switzerland is going back to deflation, and Japan is barely getting out of its deflation. So I think the goods inflation in advanced economies is going to be probably the last problem that central banks will have to worry about. Maybe asset inflation in the next few years with zero policy rate might become something to discuss uh, a little bit further. So, uh, so is Milton Friedman wrong, or is it just delayed? Let you <coughs> Well, MV is equal to PQ, but uh, if money goes up and velocity collapses and you have slack, prices may not go up. So you can believe in the money equation, but trying to understand the link between money and prices is more complicated than being one-to-one -one when you have excess capacity of collapse of velocity. <coughs> okay, on this one, maybe we'll conclude uh, the session. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you all. It's time for a drink or a sandwich or whatever we have. Thank you.